Good evening, good afternoon, everyone. Um, welcome to this uh, meeting of Solihull's Planning Committee. Um, following the end of the initial COVID-19 legislation supporting hybrid, uh, supporting virtual meetings, the Planning Committee is now being held using a hybrid approach with all members of the committee present in the council chamber. When necessary or chosen to do so, officers and speakers are able to join the meeting courtesy of the WebEx IT system. This meeting has also been broadcast live on the Council's YouTube channel and the record will be archived for future viewing. Any member of the press and public who are unable to be here in person may listen to proceedings via this broadcast. For those present in the Chamber this evening, we are continuing to apply COVID safe measures and notes on these are available within the Chamber. The participants in this meeting will be the councillors concerned the officers advising the committee and any member of the public or ward members registered to speak in the public speaking arrangements. Registered speakers will be able to address the meeting when invited to do so, either in person or remotely via the WebEx platform. Where necessary, officers are able to read out the written statements submitted in advance by registered speakers. Supporting PowerPoint slides will be presented to members during the meeting where provided. As the chairman, I will use my discretion as to the order in which participants speak and will announce whom I wish to speak. May I remind officers and members participating this evening that during the meeting, all participants are in control of their own microphones and should keep them muted unless speaking. With regards to declarations, if a declaration is required after the meeting has started, this should be announced in the usual manner. With regard to voting, may I remind members of the committee that you are only allowed to participate in the vote if you've been present for the whole agenda item, including the Office of Presentation and Debate. The usual procedure rules apply to debate during the consideration of the agenda item, and I as Chairman will have absolute discretion. If I as Chairman wish to adjourn the meeting at any point, I will announce the adjournment and inform you how long the adjournment will be. I can confirm that at the meeting this evening we have the following members, uh, Councillor Allen, Councillor Butler, Councillor Pinwell, Councillor Clements, Councillor Cole, Councillor Davis, Councillor Goff and myself, Councillor Grinsall. Um, so moving on into the meeting proper, um, first item on the agenda is apologies for absence. Do we have any? We have apologies from Councillor Cordwell and from Councillor Ryan, for whom Councillor Pinwell is substituting. Thank you. Declarations of interest uh, to receive declarations of members disclosable pecuniary interests and conflicts of interest. I have to make a declaration personally in that I will be standing down from the chair um, in regards to the application for 100 Monastery Drive uh, and will be making rep representations um, of objection um, uh, as acting as ward councillor on behalf of uh, residents. The, uh, once I have made that, day, that representation, I will leave this chamber um, and will not return until you have uh, debated the item and reached a decision. Is there any others, uh, David? Councillor Butler. Thank you, Chairman. Um, I will remain, but I will not vote on the Cheswick Green primary school issue uh, due to uh, a conflict there. I've been, had some dealings with residents regarding that matter. Councillor Clements. Thank you. Um, just to say that on item um, agenda number 10, the Whitney Evangelical uh, Free Church, I do live in the area, but I will still be voting. Thank you. Thank you. Um, Requests of members to address the meeting. Yeah, there's a request from Councillor Ian Courts on the application 20210477, which is the Whitney Evangelical Free Church. And then there's um, two for the Cheswick Green School application, which is 20210418, which are from Councillor Holt and from Councillor Hawkins. And myself, of course. I do apologise, yes, and from yourself, yes, for the uh, 100 Monastery Drive application. Thank you. 
questions and deputations? None received. Planning, planning committee forward, uh, I'll take that as being noted. Um, minutes of the previous meet or minutes of the previous meetings, because there are two. Um, can I take those as being an accurate record? Councillor Davis, Councillor Cole, thank you. Uh, item seven, the Solihull local plan policies. Um, again, I'll take those as having been noted. And at this point, I will vacate the chair um, and invite Councillor Davis, the vice chairman, to uh, take control of the meeting for the next item. Thank you. Right, thank you for that, Councillor Grinsell. We're moving to item eight then, which is 100 Monastery Drive. John, will take us through that. Thank you, Chair. Now, planning permission was granted uh, last year in 2021 for a two-storey rear extension, two-storey front extension, a rear ground floor extension, a ground floor front extension, and an increase in ridge height of 500 centimetres. With that approval, the uh, sorry, 50 centimetres or 500 millimetres. The external finish of the building as per that approval was to be approximately half render and half facing brick to match the appearance of the existing building. Now, the application that's before us this evening for determination is a, is a retrospective application that seeks the following summarised changes to that approval. So there's alterations to fenestration. There's an increase in depth of the ground floor rear extension by 40 centimetres. Uh, one of the two chimney stacks is to be removed, but leaving the other one intact. The design of the front porch is changed. A rear-facing dormer window has been built, and the entire property has been rendered rather than um, approximately a half-and-half half finish. So if I can just run you through the proposed plans. Thank you, Kim. This is the site location plan. You can see it's an existing dwelling in a, an existing residential area. Uh, it sits towards the end of the row of houses on Monastery Drive, and then there's the rears of uh, other nearby houses backing onto it. If you look at the drawing on the right-hand side, it's the block plan. You can show, you can see the extent of, uh, of the, the extensions in the main. So there's a two-story element to the front. There's also a porch as well, um, and then to the rear, there's two story and single story additions in that uh, sort of turquoise colored area. What that doesn't show is the position of the dormer window to the rear, but that shows the overall footprint and massing of the building in relation to neighboring properties. And as you can see from the site plan there, in terms of impact upon neighbors, uh, the 45 degree lines to the adjoining property are well met. It's well inside of those lines. Um, so there's no concerns, as previously there weren't in 2021, with the impact of this proposal upon any uh, neighbour's uh, amenities. So next slide, please, Kim. This shows how the property was prior to any works taking place. You can see it's a two-storey house with a, uh, a gabled roof uh, either side, with a ridge running side to side. There was an existing hipped roof, two-storey projecting element to the front, also an existing two-storey gabled uh, element to the rear, as well as single-storey additions as well. Next slide, please, Kim. Now, this was the uh, existing floor plans uh, previous to uh, any uh, previous approvals or construction work. That's the uh, first floor. Next one, please, Kim. Um, sorry, the previous one was the first floor, uh, the ground floor. This is the first floor. Next slide, please, Kim. Yeah, this one. Okay, then now this shows the proposed um, elevations that this retrospective application seeks consent for. You can see um, to the right hand side of the forward projecting element, uh, there's another two story element with a porch adjoining that. 
you can see to the rear, to the right hand side of the rear elevation, um, there is a two story gable elemented um, extension there. And if you look in the roof space above that, you will see the dormer window that forms part of this application as well. There are also other alterations to fenestration, roof lights and windows, etc. Next slide, please, Kim. Uh, this shows the proposed floor plans um, of what you're, what, what's looking to be retained tonight. There's a living room, bedroom downstairs, sitting room, dining and kitchen area, lobby and a garage. Next slide, please. And this shows the first floor plan that shows uh, a study and four additional bedrooms and then other spaces such as bathrooms, etc. Next slide, please. Kim. And this shows the roof accommodation that will be inside the dormer window as proposed, proposing an additional bedroom. Next slide, please. Now, the following slides show a comparison between the consented scheme and what we have this evening for consideration. Next slide, please, Kim. In terms of the elevations, the approved elevations to, uh, to the left, the proposed elevations are to the right. So if you look at the front elevation, which is the top left of both sets of drawings, you can see there's a slight change to the design of the porch, and you can see the addition of some roof lights as well. Uh, if you then look at the rear elevation, which is straight under that, you'll see there's alterations to windows in that some previously approved standard sized and height windows at first floor level are to be um, full length glazed doors behind a balustrade. Uh, so that would constitute uh, Juliet balconies. You can also see the dormer window there as well. And if you look at the side elevations, uh, they reflect those changes, but also show the other fairly uh, more minor changes. And there's a general reduction uh, of, of windows and doors, etc. Next slide, please, Kim. Uh, this shows a comparison of the uh, floor areas. So the ground floor area um, that although it's Difficult to, to tell from looking at it with the naked eye, but the rear extension at single story level, um, which is to house the kitchen, is slightly larger on the application that we have this evening. It's 40 centimetres deeper. Next slide, please, Kim. This is the first floor um, floor plans. We've highlighted there the change of the, uh, the windows to doors that are proposed as part of this application to uh, form Juliet balconies that will not allow access onto the flat roof. And this is the proposed floor area of the uh, of the dormer window. So next slide, Kim, if you can skip two onto the next one, we've got a series of photographs. This is the exit, this, sorry, I've, that shows the building as constructed that is um, this application seeks to retain. Yes, it's uh, rendered in its entirety. There is some stone detailing around the porch and also at the lower level around the, the elevations. That, though, isn't sought to be retained as part of this application. The applicant has agreed that that will be removed, and if approved, the building will be rendered in its entirety. Next slide, please, Kim. This is a view from the rear. Um, again, you can see the dormer window that uh, this application seeks to retain. You can also see the, uh, the two-story element and single-story element to the rear. Next slide, please. This is a view from the front, from the opposite side of the road, showing the property in the context of uh, the neighbour. Yes, the proposal does step forward uh, beyond um, number 98 to the, to the right, but the property, as it existed previously, stepped forward because the uh, the main part of that two-story projection to the front was existing this application seeks the infill smaller two-story extension to the side and in any case that is the same in terms of design and size and positioning to the 2021 permission so that that has consent in principle now we've got some photographs to show that within this area there is a varied uh, amount of house designs and types and materials and the attempt of this is to show that the rendering of a property um, isn't out of character at all, and rendering the property is a wholly appropriate way of treating um, uh, of, of treating the building. So the building before it was extended, as you can see there, was was half rendered anyway. So under permitted development rights, uh, the rest of the building um, could have been rendered in, in its entirety. That would not have needed consent at all. 
Next slide, please, Kim. This shows other examples on Monastery Drive of properties that are rendered. You can see on the top left, that's number 95 that's in the main rendered. You can see number 64 on the bottom right. And again, without the need for planning permission, both of these properties and any other properties uh, on the street that have part render on them could render the entirety of the property without the need for any sort of planning permission. Got some more examples on the next photo, please, Kim. Next slide, please, Kim. Just another house along the road, number, number 60, that has render. Next slide, that's number 64. And then the next slide, which is the final slide, uh, is some aerial shots that, so, that show large dormer windows within the area generally and show that they are um, in existence. So the retention of a large dormer wouldn't, in principle, be out of character. We have an example there at 83 Grange Road. And we have an example there at 45 Grange Road that backs directly onto this property. That's the end of the show. So the key issue is relevant to the assessment and determination of this application as set out in the report. And the recommendation is one of approval subject to conditions. But before I end, if I can just draw members' attention to the update note, which advises that the correct site location plan has been used in this presentation. It differs slightly from the site location plan that's in the plans pack in that the position of the 45 degree lines have been changed to accurately reflect where the existing habitable room windows there. But in any case, whether you take the amended site location plan or the plan that's in the pack, the proposal is in complete accordance with the 45 degree guide. Thank you, Chair. Thank you, John. The first speaker this evening then is Richard Cobb. Ah, there you are. Uh, Mr. Cobb, I'm showing sure you the, uh, the form and you have three minutes. Thank you, Chairman. Uh, I've got uh, five photographs which I hope will display while I'm talking. Um, I'm a Chartered Town Planner and represent the residents of two properties, 45 and 47 Grange Road, who back directly onto the development at 100 Monastery Drive. They have watched alarmingly as this development has grown and grown over the last 12 months, seemingly without preceding planning consent and going more than the approved scheme that was approved last year, or in 2021. The main issue for my clients is the excess, excessive height of the extended house right at the back of and in full view of their properties, far above what was originally approved. A lengthy description of the planning application is testimony to the considerable changes that have taken place to the original 2021 consent as building work has progressed. The applicants have seemingly sought to change their aspirations as they have gone along. And the elements of this retrospective planning application have changed and changed as more alterations and additions are being built. The council have been playing catch up. For my clients, the extended house behind them appears as a gross and ugly overdevelopment of the original house, behind, uh, uh, original house which is now overbearing, dominating their outlook and impacting on their privacy as well as leading to increased loss of light to garden. The addition of the loft dormer, which was not permitted development, adds considerably to the bulk of the property and appears out of proportion to the character and appearance of the other properties, both in this part of Grange Road and in Monastery Drive itself, where the mix of houses and bungalow types has remained largely unchanged since they were originally built. Although property owners, uh, owners should be allowed, able to improve and extend their homes, those works should be at an appropriate scale and designed to assimilate with the established character and appearance of the area. This has not been the case here. The planning officer's report suggests there are a wide variety of differing house types along Monastery Drive, but in my view that is not the case. The other two houses in the road, the other two-storey houses in the road are very similar, reflecting those built by the original builder and have only been changed by a modest amount by later owners. None are of the scale and bulk of the application site. The first floor bedroom extensions over the large window with over large windows shown on plan have Juliet, Juliet balconies, while those may be acceptable as shown, the large windows can lead onto the large flat roofed ground floor rear extension, which is capable of being turned into a roof terrace, potentially denying neighbour properties of privacy. Side windows are largely not obscure glass, and again leading to overlooking. The box dormer has increased the bulk of the property disproportionately, and while there may be limited overlooking from what is, it is from that, 
it is never less overbearing as can be seen in the photographs. That also shows the property before and the bulk of the extended building compared to others in the road. The committee is asked to reject this application. Thank you, Chairman. Thank you. The next speaker then is Mike Keenan, and he'll be coming up on the screen. Okay. Can you hear us, Mr. Keenan? Mr. Keenan, can you hear us? Mr. Keenan, can you can you hear us? I apologise. I've got your name down differently on paper than is appearing on the screen. So it's Mr. Kano, please. Are you there? Bear with me a moment. Hello, do you hear me? If you hear me, I actually don't know. Right, Mr. Kano. Can't hear anything. Mr. Kano. So, again, no confirmation. Yes. Okay. Can you hear us? Mr. Kano, would you like to make your presentation? Oh, you can hear me. Please? So, if it's my turn to speak, then I assume you're all hearing me. So, uh, I haven't heard anything that has been going on all this time. So, uh, maybe I will be repeating things. I don't know. So, my name is actually Mike Cano. I'm the architect who designed the extension for this property. And I'm here to defend the application on behalf of Valerie. So, I believe that the recommendation for approval from the planning officer states very clearly that the amendments to the property beyond what was originally approved have no real negative impact on the neighborhood and on the immediate neighbors from the point of view of the objections raised. Many of the amendments uh, would have fallen under permitted development rights and a non material or a non material amendment application, such as the changes to the windows on the side elevation, which were made in order to comply with the conditions of the original planning application. Um, uh, or with fire regulations so to comply with the uh, building regulation standards, or such as the change in the size of the red windows into Juliet balcony, uh, which also have no effect on the overlooking over the neighbors because the flat roof of the rear extension is not intended to be used as a terrace or, or to be accessible. Therefore, there is no overlooking more than before over the neighbor's garden, more than there originally was in the original approval. I believe that the biggest concern um, is from the neighbors is probably the addition of the rear dormer, which was added believing it was within permitted development rights following the wrong advice from other planning officers in different authorities. The massing of the dormer is not, is not out of the ordinary since it's only 31 cubic meters and is smaller than what normally permitted development allows, which is up to 50 cubic meters for detached properties. The windows in this dormer are small and the new rare roof ridge in the first floor also obstructs the view to the neighbor's garden on the right. Therefore, the massing and overlooking as well as overshadowing are not strong arguments to, the, to object to these amendments from my perspective. There are also plenty of dormers as probably have been shown um, in the same street and especially the one on the left of the property that is overlooking a few gardens due to its perpendicular 
um, position. Uh, in regards to the other development objection, which I, I read in the, there was one of you or a few, the plot is 876 uh, square meters in area. The original house had a footprint of 162 square meters, while the new footprint is 200 um, square meters. In comparison with the plot, the increase in the footprint is only a 4.3%. So there is, it's a small increase in if we compare with the overall size of the plot. So it's not really an overdevelopment in, from my perspective. The right to light of each resident and the right to enjoy their property and their garden should not trump the right to, of the neighbors to develop or decorate their own property, as long as these developments do not affect the enjoyment of the neighbors' gardens and property. In this case, the changes clearly do not have any negative impact on the surrounding area and are also not out of character since there is not a defined character in the street. Um, therefore, I believe that the neighbors' objections to this development are ungrounded, and I believe that this application should be supported. Um, that's everything I have to say. Thank you very much. Thank you, Mr. Kano. Final speaker is the board councillor, Councillor Bob Grunsell. I don't think I need to remind you of the uh, rule. Thank you, Chair. Thank you, members. Um, firstly, I have provided you with a pack of pictures that I have taken recently. You'll have seen for a few seconds some in images which the, within the officer's presentation. I hope you use these next four minutes to view my images. You will only look at them for a, a few moments, yet my affected residents will have to look at these images for the rest of their lives. Once again, you have the unfortunate task of having to decide on another retrospective application, but this application is, in my view, like no other you've had to consider before. The applicant has shown total disregard for the planning process. The applicant has failed to listen to advice from our planning officers, our planning enforcement team, and building control. More importantly, however, is the applicant's total disregard for their neighbours and local residents. More specifically, the first floor full height sliding patio doors overlooking the flat roof, referred to as Juliet balconies, which I personally believe they are not intended to be. I note that a condition in respect to these has been included, yet we have already seen that the, the applicant has never adhered to any previous conditions, so why would the applicant change their habit and not adhere to planning conditions once more? These patio doors should be replaced with more standard windows that are smaller in size to what was formally approved and thus stop any possibility of overlooking into neighbours' properties and their privacy. In regards to the dormer window, I've been advised that when officers have visited to take measurements, the dormer was not in fact completed and that the size has subsequently been increased still further. Members will, I'm sure, remember that only recently a similar application for a sim similar large dormer in Broad Oaks Road was considered by this committee and refused against officers' recommendation and was further substantiated by the inspectorate at appeal. With regards to the full height, bright white rendering, contrary to Mr Hallam's comment, there is only one fully rendered property in the whole of Monastery Drive, and that is painted in a buff colour. And even this one house is further hidden from view by a very high and dense conifer hedge. 100 Monastery Drive, as you have seen, is far from hidden from view. We are told that the application, uh, applicant had issues obtaining bricks that were similar or matching this, thus arbitrarily and without permission chose to render the whole property in bright white. Once again, the applicant should go back to what was the originally approved treatments. Furthermore, I have recently seen a video taken at night. It seems that the applicant has installed what is known as mood lighting. Mood, light, mood lighting are lights that change colour and are reflected against this bright white full height render from the flat roof. Perhaps this is the reason for choosing this bright white rendered finish. This is merely a short summary of some of the issues that the applicant has seen fit to carry out without permissions, and I could continue still further with more, but regrettably, my four minutes just don't allow for it. 
the applicant, applicant fails in so many ways, uh, specifically policy P14, where it states, permit de development only if it respects the amenity of existing and proposed occupiers and would be a good neighbour. On this, it fails. It also fails in respect to policy P15, where the application does not conserve and enhance the local character. The justification for policy P15 states, policy P15 provides a set of design principles for applicants to adhere to concerning the scale and visual appearance of the building. This does not, and it has not been adhered to. Planning laws and regulations are there for a reason. This planning committee must be seen and heard to do the right thing for all residents and not just grant approval on a retrospective application just because it's already built. In this case, I believe that it should be people before policy. And with that, members, I urge you to refuse this application. Thank you for your time. Thank you, Councillor Grinsell. Councillor Grinsell will leave the chamber now. Um, as chairman, it's my responsibility to start the debate. The council's standing orders require me to move the motion. Although I'm moving the motion, I'm still undecided on how I will vote. Do I have a seconder, please? Thank you, Councillor Cole. Members. Councillor Butler, please. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Chairman. Um, I, I, I'm going to cut straight to the chase with it. I, I think this makes an absolute mockery of the, the planning process, to be, uh, to be quite honest. Um, th this, this, this was granted, permission was granted back in March 2021. And I look at what's actually happened. We've got the dormer that's appeared, a change in external materials, a change in the size, the number, the positions of the windows, the addition of roof lights. Uh, let, let, let's take some chimney stacks off as well. There is, there is a, a trust issue here for me. There are so many issues with this. I, I have no belief that, that if this were approved, that this would not just carry on. And a, a question to officers here, were there any inspections that took place during the build and what, what, was any of this picked up during that, that build period? John? From HR. Uh, I really cannot comment on how this application was reported to and in, uh, to the council and then investigated by the council. All I can advise on is um, the assessment of the application as it stands. So, sorry, I really can't help you there. Thank you. I understand that. Uh, I, I'm, I'm sorry, Chair, but, but um, to me, like I say, I'll, I'll reiterate that, that phrase. It makes an absolute mockery of, of, of the planning process. Um, yeah, I understand the legalities here, but, but what is the point? In, in us having applications before us that we approve and then they are ignored. It's as simple as that. Thank you, Councillor Butler. Councillor Cole, please. Thank you, Chairman. I used to work in the window trade many years ago and I'm, I'm looking at this sliding patio doors on, on the um, first floor. They're definitely sliding patio doors and that they can easily be, well, not easily be turned into Juliet window for the balcony. Um, I'm not convinced you don't put a sliding patio door in unless you're going to use that roof. And question for the officers, is that roof a load-bearing roof? Can it be easily changed so people can walk on it? Thank you, Chair. Thank you, Councillor Cole. Uh, Councillor Mrs Allen. Oh, sorry, uh, John. Thank you, Chair. Uh, in terms of 
the load bearing abilities of that roof, uh, I, I really don't know. That's not a planning matter. But what I would say, though, um, one of the conditions that we're proposing is that that roof shall never, ever be used as a balcony, roof terrace or similar amenity area. So there are restrictions and conditions in place to prohibit that. You'll also note as well that the uh, approved drawings show balustrades to be put across the windows guards to stop them, uh, to stop any external, easy external access. Um, I acknowledge there isn't a condition to say that those guards shall be uh, installed and, and then permanently kept in place, but that is something we could do. And I think with the combination of that condition and the condition that we have restricting access to the roof for recreational purposes, that would ensure there's no potential use of it and uh, avoid any potential overlooking or neighbour amenity issues, Chair. Thank you, John. Now, Councillor Mrs. Allen. Thank you, Chairman. Uh, well, I'm, I won't repeat what um, Councillor Butler said, but I agree entirely with him over this. Um, and with regard to the um, uh, the the, uh, uh, the patio doors and the balcony um, that's just been referred to by Councillor Cole, if the uh, applicant has not actually adhered to conditions previously. How can we be sure that he's going to adhere to this now? And this is a huge issue um, for uh, overlooking for the uh, for the neighbours. I think the whole thing looks overbearing and pretty ugly to me. So I'm afraid for those reasons, I will not be supporting this. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor Mrs. Allen. Councillor Pinwell, please. Thank you, Chair. Uh, Monastery Drive is one of Solihull's premier roads, and I have to say that I agree with Mr. Cobb and disagree with Mr. Cano in that it has a character, and a character that, as Councillor Grinsell has indicated, needs to be sustained under our planning principles. I am looking at a picture which Councillor Grinsell has supplied to us um, of the north facing side elevation which is totally dominated by the new dormer and it is clear that that will also be the view that faces anybody driving a vehicle from Grange Road into Monastery Drive as they see that side elevation facing them. And I have to agree with Councillor Allen that it looks exceedingly ugly, it looks oversized, the massing is far out of character with the road. Um, so I believe that this design is not consistent with our planning regulations. The examples that we saw on the photographs of existing dormers did not have the sort of scale that we are looking at here and appeared to be a lot more symmetrical in their installation as well as smaller in the roofs in which to, they are set. Finally, I think it happens too frequently that this planning committee is faced with a retrospective application for features that would never have been approved in the first place, and we have to stop that trend. So I, frankly, do not approve of this planning application. Uh, thank you, Councillor Pinwell. Councillor Elf, please. Thank you, Chair. I'll be very brief because uh, my colleagues have already said very much of what I'm thinking. Um, Councillor Pinwell summed things up very, very well there. Um, it doesn't sit with the local uh, street scene. In fact, it's a, a monstrosity I would, uh, I would use. Uh, I thought uh, Councillor Grinsall was quite polite when he talked about the mood lighting because uh, I've also seen that mood lighting in full effect and I would say it looked more like a discotheque than anything else. So if you know, that's the sort of things that are going on at the moment before this is completed. I really do feel for the neighbors in the local area about what they're gonna be facing for a very, very long time in the future. 
So, uh, you know, that being said, and uh, echoing the concerns of my colleagues, uh, I won't be supporting this application. Thank you, Chair. Thank you, Councillor Gough. Councillor Clements, please. Thank you, Chair. Well, this is the white elephant in the room, isn't it? Um, when I'm looking at it, the proposed windows on the original planning application did have whether or not they were sliding doors or perhaps it was more of a French window. It's not what's been installed. So as has been said before, whatever is said will be done. What Would it actually be done really? Now, when we're talking about the rendering, I understand what officers have said that uh, they don't need planning for that. But I would have thought that if you were going to be sympathetic with the area and your neighbours that have to look at the side of that property, then perhaps on the side aspect, just the lower side, uh, the lower half of the property would be rendered white just to keep in um, with the rest of the property as they've uh, currently rendered it. But perhaps we can't say anything about that. But my main issue, apart from the windows, I don't think that we would have been looking to approve those sliding doors and the size of them. Um, of course, if they're not already obscure windows to the side, they need to be obscured. But as I was going to say, my main issue is with that side elevation and the dormer. Um, there's no sign of the roof line. That totally just looks like the side of a block of flats. And it's just not sympathetic or aesthetically pleasing at all. And due to the size, it's not something that I would want to approve. So it's not something that I will be approving. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Councillor Mrs. Clements. Councillor Cole, did you indicate you wanted to come back? I did, Chair, but I think it's all been said. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, members, any any further comments? Mr. Hallam, do you want to come back? Can I just make a few closing comments, please, Chair? Uh, well, it's clear that the key issues here relate to impact upon residential amenity and impact on character and appearance. I think we've discussed the impact on residential amenity quite a bit. But if I can just say all side facing first floor windows are to be fitted with frosted glass to avoid overlooking as you would always expect. So there's no overlooking there. We've spoken about the restriction on the use of the flat roof as a terrace or balcony. Something Councillor Clements has just mentioned that we wouldn't normally approve full height doors in that sort of location. Well, we do. We, we approve that sort of thing um, you know, day in, day out. And, and even at a later stage, um, you can anyone, any homeowner can put full height glazing in their rear elevation without the need for planning permission. And that could happen on this property as well. So with the condition restricting access to the uh, flat roof and with the condition ensuring in perpetuity retention of the balustrades, there will be no impact on residential amenity. So I think you would struggle to find a credible reason to refuse it on those grounds. Turning now to design and character. The bulk design appearance, other than the dormer window and the cladding in its entirety, is pretty much as, as approved. That's the fallback position. So they're the two key differences. It's the cladding, it's the dormer window. I've said about the cladding, yes, perhaps there's differing views as to uh, whether or not um, um, members think that's acceptable in this location. But if it were to be refused because of the excessive amount of cladding, the existing uh, the fallback position, the 2021 consent, has permission for the building to be half clad. They could finish the work and then under permitted development, clad the rest of it. So it would be in the same position as to where we are now, leaving the only outstanding matter being the dormer window. Now, dormer windows of this size often are built under permitted development. In this instance, it isn't because of cumulative increase in volume of roof extensions elsewhere. Um, and again, a point that Councillor Clements mentioned, how there's no sign of the roof line in the side elevation. And I agree, it goes straight up from the, uh, the gable end. And it would be preferable to reinstate that roof line so there's definition between the main part of the house and the dormer window. Now, this is an approach that we took as a committee, or you took as a committee, uh, a few committees ago in Castle Brom, where there was a similar situation, and the eaves line was reinstated by condition. And if that alleviated members' concerns about the impact of the dormer window and how it relates to the house generally, uh, a condition could be imposed requiring uh, a deta an eaves detail to be reinstated in accordance with details to be submitted to us, which would then 
uh, reinstate a bit of the balance and the, uh, the symmetry of the original property and show a definite line and difference between that and the dormer window. That is an option available to you. And as a planning officer, I think that would alleviate concerns, but, but clearly it's your decision. Thank you, Chair. Thank you, Mr. Hallam. Yes, Councillor Butler. Sorry, uh, just one final question, um, and it's a point of clarification, really. Well, I think it was the architect that, uh, that, that spoke saying that the dormer window uh, was within permitted development. Um, officers are saying it's not within permitted development. Just some clarification there. Is, is it or isn't it? <laughs> I could give you a lengthy explanation or I could just tell you the fact. No, it isn't. That's why it's uh, here for consideration this evening. Thank you. Uh, members, this uh, is shown as an amendment. I think it's a retrospective application. And again, and this is not the first time, it's a blatant disregard for the work of our planning department and the work of this committee. You're fairly unanimous in what you're saying in so much as we've that the domination I think it was um, on the north side I think Councillor Pinwell said and uh, questions were raised as to whether they would adhere to the condition um, also the size of the dormer you've you've raised and uh, and again somebody else raised the dormer so it's the dormer that's appeared mainly to be committee's concern. Mr. Hallam has pointed out that a number of um, areas uh, um, are, uh, they could do under PD anyway, um, but not the, not the dormer because of its, uh, its volume, I think. It's not square meterage, what am I looking for, John? That's right, Chair, it's, it's volume in conjunction with other alterations to the roof. So if there'd been no previous roof extensions, uh, to the property, this dormer would have constituted permitted development on its own, but because there's other additions elsewhere, cumulatively, they've gone above the uh, the limit. So, the application, the, the building works could have been deconstructed, and if they'd been built in the right order, um, then it may well have needed planning, uh, not needed planning permission, and we wouldn't be here this evening. Mm. Uh, thank you for that, and of course, members will be aware of the previous property where we we refused because of the dormer. And we've recently uh, we've won that appeal. So I'm tending now to go to the vote. So the um, bear with me. Right. So members, I'm asking the <coughs> excuse me. You're being asked to approve subject to conditions. That's what we've been asked for. Those who wish to, uh, in favour of that, please show. No, none in favour. Sorry, I was taking you on the way. Um, right. So the alternative then now is not to approve. Members, I'm now going to ask you to vote if you wish to refuse this application. Those in favour of refusal, please show. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven. That's unanimous, Chairman. Thank you, Members. That uh, that application is refused. Aisha will Sorry, speak to us. Can we just, um, we've already had the reasons for refusal. Do we need to go through them again? Just to reiterate, please. Just, just to confirm, with policy P15 as primary reason for refusal. Yep. Yeah, okay. So um, the reasons for refusal will be delegated to officers in conjunction with the chair and vice chair, as is normally the course. Um, all the details will be passed on to yourselves, but they're mainly dotted down, so that's a refusal. Thank you. Yeah. yeah. 
Thank you for that then. Um, yes, can we get the chairman back in please? I've sat here quite a long time now, over the last few years. <laughs> Uh, thank you, Councillor Davis, for sitting in for me. Appreciate it. Um, we move on to the next item on the agenda, which is uh, item 10, Windley Evangelical Free Church, pages 35 um, to 62. Um, is that you again, John? Yeah, carry on, please. Thank you, Chair. Full planning permission is sought to demolish the existing church or building that currently occupies the existing backland site to be replaced with a terrace row of four three-storey townhouses. Six parking spaces are to be provided. The building is three storeys in height, but remains subservient to the frontage properties, being 0.4 of a metre lower. Due to the carefully thought out design of the building, which includes staggered building lines to break up the massing of the building, and a carefully selected palette of materials that includes various red tones and a predominantly zinc clad second storey, the scale and massing of the building is reduced to an appropriate level, and this is a view shared by the Council's urban designers. Flat roof buildings are present in the area, with there being a vast flat roofed extension area to the rear of the fronted units on Whitney Road. An appropriate amount of amenity space is proposed for each unit, being 10.9 metres in depth, and there is no undue impact on neighbour amenity. Now, the access to the site is via an existing driveway that currently serves the church hall. The access itself does not comply in its entirety with the aims of the fairly recently adopted backland SPD, but it must be appreciated that the access is existing and refusing the, and refusing the application due to this would not change this fact. The impact would still be there. As such, in line with the advice of the SPD, the weight to be attached to the consideration of the access's compliance with the SPD should be reduced. That said, the access parking and turning areas are sufficient, the proposal will not be harmful to highway safety, and the site is, is within a sustainable location. So I can just take you through the submitted plans, please, Kim. Next slide. Here's an aerial photograph. It's the site highlighted in yellow. Uh, it's behind on Whitney Road. I'm sure you all know it. There's a, a, a local parade of shops. Um, and on there, there's the single story church building. And when I say single story, it's, it's, it's big for a single story, um, given that it's uh, you know, a community hall venue. Next slide, please, Kim. Now, this shows the site. This shows the application. Uh, it's, at, it's edged in red. You can see the access there is in between the row of um, shops fronting Whitney Road, and there's another commercial property to the left. Um, the site um, extends to the rear, and on that site you can see it's in white. That's the footprint of the, uh, the row of four dwellings. You can see the parking area to the front and also to the side, so that's to the left, where there's two nose-to-tail spaces with the, uh, the green areas, the, the residential garden areas to the rear. So in terms of built form, um, and again, making reference to the backland SPD, there certainly is an appropriate mix of amenity space, built form and circulation areas that does not um, extend beyond what we'd be looking to achieve for any backland site. Next slide, please, Kim. Now here are the, are the elevations um, and the cross section as well. So if you start with the cross section, um, you can see that uh, it is lower than the frontage buildings. And again, if we're looking at the cross section still, you can see the vast extent of flat roofed extensions to the rear and set against that, um, that, that form of existing development. So given the height of the two storey frontage buildings with the pitched roof, the character, the appearance of, this, of the flat roofed elements to the rear, the proposal certainly doesn't look big or out of character in size. 
And looking at the design of it, you can see how the second floor uh, is treated in a different material to, uh, to break up its massing. And again, you can see, especially in the front elevation, the articulation proposed by the, uh, the front elevation that, that changes in the projection uh, as you go along its length. So next slide, please. Kim, here we have some CGIs. I don't think you can read a great deal into the materials used there. They would need to be submitted and approved by officers, of course, so that's just purely indicative. Next slide, please, Kim. Now, the next two slides, so this and the next one, show the detail of the drainage system that's proposed. Um, as the report sets out, um, the, the lead local flood authorities, so the, the, the council-based uh, drainage experts, are content with that scheme. Uh, and you'll see that in the report there is a condition requiring its, uh, its installation in accordance with those details. So there's no drainage concerns there. So if you can skip two, please, Kim. Thank you. We're now moving on to photographs. So this shows from Whitney Roads, uh, one sort of half of the row of shops. It also shows the access that leads to the rear. You can see that the part of the, uh, the church hall that sticks out slightly um, at the end of that access. Next slide, please. This is looking back. This is standing within. There's a, there's a shared parking area to the rear of the shops. This is just in front of the church building, so just in front of the application site. So any access will have to cross this area to get to the proposed development. That's looking back along the access, back towards uh, Whitney Road. Next slide, please, Kim. It's a similar view of the same thing. Next slide, please. This is a view of perhaps the widest part of the access, showing a car parked on one side, and again, showing that there is space for two cars to pass along there. Next slide, please, Kim. That's the existing church hall that is now unused and has been unused for some time. Um, you can see there, whereas I said it was single story, it is, but it's a, but it's a high single story building. You can see in the background as well, um, a lot of trees, there's a wooded area behind. They are lo they're located outside of the sites, and I can confirm to members that as part of this application, there isn't any proposed removal of trees um, other than a little bit of removal of light scrub because trees are located outside of the boundary, so there's no loss. This is looking to the side of the church building, back along the access. Next slide, please, Kim. Church building again. As is the next slide. This final this slide here shows the trees I've just referred to at the back. As does the next slide. And then the final two, we have a couple of aerial shots where you'll see the frontage units on Whitney Road. You'll see the extent of the flat roofed extensions to the rear and also the existing building in situ. And the next photo, please, Kim, is similar, but just from a different angle. So that doesn't really add much to the presentation. That's it, uh, Chair. Thank you. Thank you, John. Um, we have three speakers on um, this item. Um, Ms. Lance, uh, you have three minutes if you care to do, give your presentation. Thank you. Thank you. Um, I have some photos. Um, if they could please be put on the screen. I've been asked to speak against this current proposal on behalf of deeply concerned neighbours, many of whom are elderly, long-standing Bentley Heath residents. The unnecessary tone of the letter from Tyler Parks published on the Solihull Planning website 16th of February, pressurising the SMBC Planning Department to grant planning permission for this blatant overdevelopment scheme is very concerning. It seems that the address response to some of our objections is exceptionally verbose, full of jargon, and in some respects, cynical. Cramming four three-bedroom, three-storey homes with limited parking and zero allowance for HGV manoeuvrability leads residents to believe this current scheme is solely designed to maximise profits for here today, gone tomorrow developers and unjustly penalises our community, including the existing daily activity within the thriving shopping area. A delivery vehicle or HGV completely obstructs the driveway anywhere from six to ten times per day, up to an hour each delivery. 
including during rush hour, where any residents living in the proposed overdevelopment will be unable to leave their property. There is evidence There is evidence of previous accidents, scarred walls and bollards in the tight entry exit to the driveway. The shopping precinct car park is a one-way system and for a vehicle to pull out of the driveway onto oncoming traffic would cause conflict or worse, a head-on collision. Therefore, it would be near impossible to turn left or right onto Woodney Road safely. The developers acknowledge that Solihull Waste Disposal Services cannot access the site and 16 bin and recycling containers must be curbside collections. Looks fine on paper until you observe the reality there is no curbside. The site leads directly onto the shopping precinct parking entrance. Wheelie bins would either block the shops on the pavement um, to the left or the vets to the right. Emergency service vehicles and um, fire exit access for potential residents would be completely compromised when a delivery was taking place. Is there no safety issues or areas of conflict to worry about here? Some SPD backland development guidelines seem to have been conveniently overlooked in this application. The style of the proposed houses in this overdevelopment are not in keeping in any way with properties in the local area, nor would they enhance character or local diversity. One car park space per proposed three bedroom house is insufficient, especially as Solihull Council are introducing new parking restrictions in the area. 25th of June 21 flooding indicated current storm water drainage inadequate to cope with the current lay of the land. Uh, photo evidence has been provided to you which shows the size and style of the church which is in keeping with local properties. Some of the HGV daily use of the driveway and a car park and the car park in front of the shopping area. Our objections have the full support of the KDBH forum, the DDRA and some local councillors. We would urge this committee to reject the proposal in its current form and make a site visit during a daytime weekday because if these issues are left I must unchecked, ask you to sum up. Okay. You, I've, I've given you a little bit of leeway but I must ask you to sum up. Okay. If these issues are left unchecked they will be forever running sores at the heart of Bentley Heath community long after the proponents have departed. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, next speaker is Mr Parks. Uh, you know you have three minutes. Thank you. Thank you. Um, good evening all. Um, this proposal has been with the council for some time. Ms Parks, thank you. Um, and has been negotiated positively through the pre-application formal application process to arrive at a point where your officers have recommended the application for approval. It has been considered in a lot of detail to get to this point, with your urban design and highways officers being consulted on the compliance of the proposal with the Council's Backland SPD. Consequently, there are no technical objections to the proposal. This proposal involves a brownfield site in an urban area and is a site and building that is currently standing empty. Its use to deliver a small number of dwellings will make efficient use of an area of previously developed land in a highly sustainable location where people want to live. It complies with policy and will not result in impact on current standards of amenity. The, there seems to be um, mostly concerns around the uh, access but ha as your highways officer has confirmed and reaffirmed in the further consultation response, there are no highways objections to the proposal. The access is in use uh, with, good, with good intervisibility and to my knowledge without incident. The appellant has a right of way over the access to serve this site and the development will benefit from that legal right. Um, just addressing the point with regard to flooding, um, there's been a detailed drainage assessment and flood risk assessment for this proposal, which um, has demonstrated that it can be satisfact satisfactorily drained. Um, and there is also a condition attached to the plan permission, which would actually require the implementation of that drainage scheme. In my view, the proposal represents a positive use of pre previously developed land. But I suppose the question is, what would be the possible alternative use for this site, if not for residential? some sort of commercial perhaps but in all probability that would generate amenity issues being in close proximity to residential boundaries 
Therefore, it is considered that residential uh, represents a good use of this piece of land. In all the circumstances, it is considered that the proposal represents an acceptable form of development, and I hope that members will feel able to support the application and grant consent. Thank you very much. Thank you, Ms. Parks. <coughs> Final speaker, Councillor Courts. Uh, I don't have to remind you, Councillor Courts, that you have four minutes. Uh, thank you, um, Mr. Chairman. I'm sorry I'm informal, but I got called out by the early five o'clock uh, announcement. I didn't have time to go and get a proper jacket. But um, members, I, I'm against this development. I'm objecting to it as I did originally um, for a number of reasons. It, it is too cramped. Uh, parking at one space uh, per dwelling uh, is inadequate when there's no space anywhere else, uh, not just here, but in the local streets for, uh, for, for parking. There's no visitor accommodation. And of course, the access is too tight. And I mean, not only is there a pinch point, but for anyone who uses those shops, the, the co-op and the other shops at the front, uh, it is quite tricky. It's quite tricky to drive in and use the car park spaces, let alone go in and out um, of, of this access, particularly if there is uh, lorries uh, and whatever there. Um, ultimately, you know, um, some of these, there may be no technical objections, but some of these are subjective as to whether you, fit, whether you actually agree that a development which is packed in every square foot it possibly could, there's no room for landscaping. Uh, the port report is contradictory. On the one hand, it says there'll be some, uh, some landscaping, well, a pot plant maybe, but there's room for probably one tree and that's it. So the, in my opinion, there's lack of compliance with some of, of the council's own uh, policies. But you know, some of these like out of character for the air is your uh, subjective uh, uh, opinion, whether you think a flat roof on a residential property here is in character of the area. By the way, a flat roof that the, the, the um, uh, cut through, uh, I mean, it shows the height is consistent with the parade of shops, but you're going to see this around the area, this, this building, because it will be, it will, will stick out like a large oblong um, brick thing. Um, I, on page 37, there's a reference to the Nolan Dorridge uh, Bentley Heath Forum um, there, and it says they re initially raised no objection, and there's, there's a reference to, their, uh, to what they say, but it, it's in no way a comprehensive. They've put a lot of time and trouble in, into assessing this. They're not uh, neighbours, I don't think, who they're, they're looking at it from, a, from uh, the forum who have put in a lot of effort to produce a neighbourhood plan, and they object to it on a whole range of, of reasons, um, none of which are actually reflected to uh, uh, as quoted. So please, you know, the forum has made strenuous objections and, and said why this isn't consistent with either the Backlang SBD nor the uh, neighbourhood uh, forum. Now, just a, a few references to um, other points in here. Now, I, t I take a, a view this is not consistent. I mean, there's, there's on page 40, there's a reference to the rail station. Well, what does that mean? It says 800 metres. Well, it isn't. It's a mile. I've checked it. It's a mile to one and 1.3 to another. It means you're going to need parking here. You're going to need car uh, transport. There's um, a reference on page 42 and 43 uh, to, um, you know, what the, what the backland thing should be doing. Encourage biodiversity, minimise the env environmental impacts of new housing. How can this possibly encourage biodiversity when there's barely, there's barely going to be room for one tree? Then there's a reference uh, on, to, and this is probably as key as anything, on page 47 about the backland development. And it actually says vehicle access to a backland residential development can be problematic. Can it be more problematic to this, than this? Access to the site for emergency vehicles and refuse collection can also cause problems. And yet here we have a, a case where that could be blocked for up to an hour uh, a day by servicing uh, the co-op and, and other shops. And they have objected too. And, you know, um, it, in conclusion from this, I do not believe this respects the character of the area. It, it may well be a housing site. I don't think I would deny that. But yet again, we're in a situation where we allow developers to pack every single thing they can on the site and say, instead of saying, look, scale it down a bit, allow space for landscaping and reduce the actual um, size. And my final comment, I'm not sure what the timing is, but I'm probably over. Um, 
but perhaps not. Um, I'm actually curious to look at the, the size of the dwellings. And I thought, well, if you can you get... You are over, and uh, I, have, I have to ask you to sum up very, very quickly, Councillor Okay, Okay, um, I'm, I'm not going to... Uh, I'll just make a last point in terms of the size of these dwellings. Um, you know, four of them, that they really are... Uh, these, what, are 12 feet wide, three-seater sofa and a table. They won't fit in, in, in uh, most houses of that size. So I think the drawings are somewhat misleading. Anyway, I urge members to uh, reject this application. Thank you. Um, it is my responsibility to start the debate. The Council's standing orders require me to move the motion. Although I'm moving the motion, I'm still undecided on how I will, how I will vote. Do I have a second? Councillor Davis, thank you. Members, uh, Councillor Davis. <clears throat> yes, thank you, uh, Chairman. I have great concerns about this in terms of the vehicular uh, activity and the comings and goings. I pass this site every time I come into Solihull and also I go walk down into Bentley Heath for my, uh, well, I won't say daily exercise, but exercise. Um, so I know this area quite well and I've witnessed, as have many others, the arrival of the lorries going into the uh, backyard there to uh, stock up the co-op shop um, the driver reverses in uh, on all occasions I believe I believe that the two bollards were put there after one of the lorries didn't quite make it and may have damaged either the um, the veterinary practice which is to the left of the site looking from Whitney Road or maybe even to the the co-op building itself um, I did ask I want to answer a question, and that was uh, as to who owns the uh, the total of the site within the red line, um, because the red line is shown as going right round the outside of the site, and down to and including the the frontage right out to Whitney to Whitney Road. Um, when vehicles leave, as they do from here. Most of them know the, the routine. They come out and they turn left into the service road and then they access Whitney Road from the exit to the service road. Those not in the know, if the, which way these people would be, would be coming out and would be in fact against the flow of the traffic coming in. And if they're trying to do a right turn, that could be at times uh, a problem. I would also query the, uh, and I think Councillor Courts mentioned this, uh, the uh, the refuse vehicle uh, access to the site. Um, the refuse vehicle, if it was able to get in, would of course reverse in as he does into lots of cul-de-sac roads and all the rest of it. So he would be reversing in. Um, in regard to the pedestrians, where the, there is no, there is no room there to build a pavement, and putting a line down, or um, I think it was said uh, coloured bricks or, or whatever, uh, won't work because again the lorry wouldn't be able to get in at all if it adhered to what they if that because that's meant to be a curb, but it's just a, a, a line a, a red line. Um, looking further on in the report, and I'm looking at the deliveries to the uh, co-op in particular, um, it said that there are six or so vehicles a day delivered to the co-op. Um, and that also these vehicles can be parked there for 30 to 60 minutes as a time. So if you say an average of, uh, say, seven vehicles a day and 45 minutes, that's five hours, 25 minutes every day out of an eight hour working day. I can see considerable congestion there, annoyance by the occupiers of the new properties, um, and uh, not a very satisfactory uh, way of dealing with things, particularly if people are waiting to get out to work or they've got to be at the school to meet the little one at a particular time. Uh, there will no doubt be friction. Um, and one would like to avoid that, obviously, at all costs. But uh, first of all, Chairman, I would like to know who, who owns the, the total site. Uh, Mr. Hallam, John. Thank you, Chair. 
Okay, the site itself, um, so if you refer to page 59 of your plans pack, well, there's several site plans, but that, that's a good one to use. Um, the main section, the, the widest section of the site is mostly highlighted in pink on that, um, which is pretty much uh, a fairly even square shape. That land is owned by the applicant. The remainder of it, which is the access and a bit of parking and turning at the end, as I understand it, is owned by whoever owns the shops, uh, the front Whitney Road. But the owner of the site itself, uh, the application site, has a legal right of way across all of that land to gain access to the site. Right. Thank you for, uh, for that, uh, Chairman. Uh, no further comment at the moment. Thank you. Councillor Allen. Thank you, Chairman. Um, actually, um, um, I, I was going to say all that. <laughs> I was, and I'd actually worked it out that, I mean, six to eight deliveries um, per day, approximately 30 to 60 minutes. I, I, I thought, well, that could be eight hours a day. Not just one hour, as uh, as uh, council courts thought it would be, and it says here there will be a very low chance for conflict between future residents and delivery vehicles. But we know that the vehicles back into that site, and um, and they park in the narrowest bit of the gap. It, so it is. It's uh, the whole thing is uh, is a um, highways nightmare, really. It's just asking for asking for trouble, I think. Thank you. Councillor Cole. Thank you, Chair. I do share Councillor Davis's concerns on this, uh, but what I would like to know from officers is the, the co-op shop. What hours are the opening hours and what hours are the delivery hours? Because there's nothing more infuriating than to have a refrigerated lorry parked under your window when you're trying to get some sleep early in the morning. It's really annoying. So I would like to know what opening times there are and what and what the delivery times are, please. Thank you. John. Thank you, Thank you Chair. Uh, that's the information that we do not have. I can't confirm delivery hours or um, opening hours. So, uh, other than I wouldn't have thought that any delivery vehicles would um, be looking to unload a ride at the back of the site adjacent to these properties. Thank you, Chair. Thank you. Can I come back, uh, Chair, yes, very certainly. quickly? Um, there are many instances where uh, these lorries turn up before before opening time, and I have grave concerns about that, turning up refriger refrigerated lorry or any lorry that's unloading. Um, they make a noise, and if it's if it's early of the morning, it's really annoying. And you know, I really need to know the hours, the opening hours, if possible. Uh, I'll let you come back, but quickly, but but with facts, not any opinions, please. I've got some facts, Chair, off the internet. Uh, the opening hours of uh, the Bentley Heath Co-op are 7 a.m. till 10 p.m. There's nothing to stop a vehicle turning up at 6 then, Chair. Councillor Butler. Thank you, Chairman. Um, my... Uh, my issues are again with um, with access. Um, I think we all know that that particular area very well. Uh, you know, I, I've certainly lived in, in in and around that area most of my life, all 21 years, um, and it, it, it is a nightmare outside those shops. Um, it, it, it is a real pain. The, the issue that I have is that is that what we've got is on paper and, and reality, and that quite often they're two distinctly different things. Um, if if the parking spaces are occupied, or there is a lorry in situ, then a vehicle that drives up that access then will undoubtedly have to reverse back out. It's then going to be re reversing back out onto Whitney Lane into a bus stop, which is on the other side of the road. The access is uh, 
screened by the VETS sign. There's the big 608 sign, if I remember there, the blue and white sign, and a hedgerow. Yes, we, we, th there is provision for uh, a, a lorry to uh, park alongside the rear uh, of, of the building. Um, but to get out, that, that lorry is going to have to manoeuvre somewhat. It, it, it cannot just uh, drive out or, or reverse out due to the angle of, of, the, um, of the fence. If we look at the, the frequency of deliveries, and we, we've, we've discussed this already, but that they, are, they are numerous. And it states here that whilst deliveries occur throughout the day, access to the proposed dwellings could be restricted temporarily. Well, it's temporarily while we have a delivery, and, and that could be for five hours of the day. I don't know how that's going to work for, for, for residents. And I have grave concerns about vehicles going up there, finding that they can't park and having to rush back out into the road, into a busy road with a bus stop there. So the, the, the highway issue is, is problematic for me, Chair. Thank you. There's a number of members wishing to speak. Um, respectfully, can uh, I see a general consensus in terms of the vehicle access. I don't really want to have repetition. Um, Councillor Clements. Thank you. Um, so I'll keep it brief then, because many of what uh, I would say is very similar to what's already been said. But when I visited the co-op myself, um, it's right that it is open seven days a week, 7 a.m. till 10 p.m. But what the manager there said was is that they're not really in control of those deliveries, so it could turn up at 6.30 a.m. in the morning. I asked what deliveries they do have. So there are four bread deliveries every day, one milk delivery a day, um, a chilled delivery every day, four times ambient dry items um, four times a week, egg deliveries four times a week, sandwich deliveries six days a week, seasonal deliveries such as Easter, Christmas, and I think that that gives an idea of the amount of time that that access would be used. And so, although there appears not to be any highway objections, I'm sure there'd be objections from potential residents of not being able to get out of their property. And whilst I was there, the, the back area is used by the co-op staff to park their cars, but we're also not in control of people using the shops that also park the cars down there, whether they should or shouldn't, they do. And there was a driver trying to get in at the time while I was there to make a delivery. And he had to wait while they were trying to find out who the one particular car belonged to that had just abandoned it there while they were no doubt shopping. Or perhaps they'd gone to the vets, I don't know. Um, so I think that sums it up, really. Thank you. Uh, Councillor Penrell. Thank you, Chair. Um, this site is just a few yards outside my ward, um, and the parade of shops was the nearest parade of shops to where I used to live, so I'm very familiar with it too. I won't repeat what's been said about access, but I would make the observation in terms of the chaos that's been described around the parking area that there have been more than a few occasions when I have gone to go to those shops, found it impossible to park anywhere near those shops and decided I'll just go on to Dorridge. It is that bad there, particularly on a Thursday and a Friday and a Saturday during the daytime. Um, so I do think that the provision of parking at the proposed premises is insufficient. I would also add to what Councillor Court said about the proximity of the rail station by saying that in that same table on page 40, it is not helpful to say that there's 100 metres to the nearest bus stop because locally that bus service is regarded as not very useful at all. An hourly service um, is not commensurate with going into Solihull or getting to Solihull Rail Station because if you happen to miss a bus, you've got 59 minutes to wait for the next one and people just find that unacceptable and leap into their cars. 
finally, I would say that my understanding is that there is a reason why the former pre premises were shot and that was a lack of usage and i think we would find that with four residential properties there the amount of traffic going up and down the access road to the premises behind might actually exceed that that was there several years ago when the church was in use thank you that's the goal Thank you, Chair. You'll be very pleased to know I don't wish to talk about parking or vehicle access or anything of that nature. But what I will say is uh, I'm going to use a phrase that's come to this uh, committee many times, uh, squeezing a pint into a quart would be my uh, thought on this. Uh, I'm not against... I think it's the other way around, though. Councilor yeah, you God. know what I mean. <laughs> Okay, he threw me there. So, yeah, I'm not against uh, development um, of the site in, in, you know, generally. But, uh, you know, when I first looked at the plans, I thought, you know, who would put three properties into a site that big? And then I looked again and I saw it was four. You know, uh, if it was um, an application for potentially two residential properties on that site, I'd be quite mindful to approve it. But it's not, is it? It's for four. So, uh, based on that, you know, I won't be supporting that chair. Thank you. As the dose, you you did indicate, um, please. Thank you, Chairman. Uh, very brief this time. Um, was the fire service consulted in regards to access? I'll come back if I may, Chairman. No, Chair. Chairman, uh, I would have can thought... I, uh, uh, can I cut in with the greatest of respect to you, Councillor Davis? Why? <laughs> There's I, existing well, development... I'm oh, it... sorry. Sorry. There's existing development on the site, Chair, as, as, as I've explained before. Um, if there are concerns with the... Uh, the width of the access and uh, vehicles being able to access it or blocked um, or indeed the distance of the access and whether or not a fire appliance can actually get down there. There is an existing building that has the ability to house a vast congregation. So I see how I do not see any difference between people accessing the using the access to access houses as opposed to using the uh, access to access the, the hall or any other use that may be down there. There just is no difference between the two, so I don't see how the la the access or the ability of vehicles to pass down there can be material to this consideration, Chair. Thank you. Um, it, it is a concern of mine, frankly, and and uh, I concur with Councillor Goff that it is um, putting a quart into a pint pot. Um, it's over development in my point of view, and I take on board everyone's um, uh, concerns with highways. Um, and uh, again, I'm always surprised that our highways never seem to have any comment. Um, so uh, I'm going to put the uh, I'm going to move to the vote. Now, the recommendation is one of approval subject to conditions. Those in favour of approval subject to conditions, please show. I would be in favour, Chairman. Thank you. I would now like to ask members um, to suggest some reasonings that we can utilise. Uh, officers can utilise in terms of the potential of voting for the refusal. Thank you. Councillor Call and then Councillor Gough. Yes, um, I would say that one of the material concerns should be a potential noise from unloading vehicles early morning and late evening, and also safety concerns exiting onto the main road. Councillor Gough. 
Thank you, Chair. Uh, I would suggest uh, policy P15 uh, over development scale of massing. Councillor Clements. I'm assuming it might come under the same P15, but it's out of character with the area. Just looking at policy P15, um, all development proposals will be expected to achieve good quality, inclusive and sustainable design, which meets the following key principles. I won't read them all out. It serves and enhances local character, distinctiveness and streetscape quality, and ensures that the scale, massing, density, layout, materials and landscape of the development respect the surrounding natural built and this historic in environment. Um, I think that particular things, um, uh, there is another part of policy P15, V11, um, which states creates attractive, safe, active, uh, legible and uncluttered streets and public spaces which are accessible, easily maintained and encourage walking and cycling and reduce crime and the fear of crime. I think those two particular things uh, under within policy P15 cover it. So therefore, uh, I'm going to move to the vote for refusal based on what I've just read out, uh, uh, policy P15, specifically policy P15-1 and V11. Um, those in favour of refusal. It's one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. That's the unanimous chairman. Thank you. The application is refused. Chairman, should there be reference to the access, say inadequate safe access, or words to that effect? Well, I, I think policy P15 V11 states creates attractive, safe, active, legible and uncluttered streets and public spaces which are accessible. I think that probably covers it because we, we, we know that um, a pure highways reasoning um, doesn't actually um, stand up very well. So based on that, I'm proposing a vote to refuse that. I'm sorry, I've done that. It has been refused and it's under those uh, re those reasonings. Thank you. The next item is the application uh, for Homer Road uh, that starts on page 63 of your packs. Um, Matt, over to you. Thank you, Chair. This application seeks outline permission for the redevelopment of the site to provide 72 one- and two-bedroom open market apartments. The proposal provides 42 two-bedroom units and 30 one-bedroom units in two separate blocks. A contribution of £740,000 will be secured by a Section 106 agreement to support off-site affordable housing provision. Access is from Homer Road and 27 car parking spaces are provided. The proposal has rooftop gardens and amenity space on both buildings. At this stage, permission is sought for layout, scale, access and landscaping insofar as it relates to buildings one and two. Site landscaping and appearance are reserved for later approval. Uh, next slide, please, Kim. This shows the application site and surrounding area. The application site is located within Solihull Town Centre. Next slide, please. This shows the application site and surrounding land uses. Broadly speaking, commercial and retail development is located to the east, which is annotated blue and purple, and residential development is located to the west, which is annotated light green. Next slide, please. This shows the application site and surrounding area in more detail. Annotation A, which is yellow, <coughs> shows the application site. 
the application site has planning permission for a seven storey office building. This permission remains extant. Annotation B is the closest residential development known as Consort House. Annotation C is currently a private multi storey car park. However, this site has planning permission for a five storey residential development of 60 apartments. This permission is also extant. Next slide, next slide please. This shows the approved residential and oh, sorry, this shows the existing site. Annotation A is the application site. Annotation B is consort house and annotation C is a private multi-storey car park. And the next two slides show slightly different angles of this arrangement. This shows the approved residential and office developments. Annotation A is the approved seven storey office building. Annotation B is consort house. Annotation C is the approved five storey residential development of 60 apartments. And the next two slides show this from slightly different angles. This shows the proposed development and approved residential development. Annotation A is the proposed residential development, the subject of this application. Annotation B is consort house. And annotation C is the approved five-story residential development of 60 apartments. The next two slides show this in a slightly different arrangement. This shows the proposed landscaping on building one, which faces Homer Road. Next slide, please. Again. This shows the proposed landscaping on building one, which faces Consort House. This shows the proposed roof gardens and amenity space, which should be available to all residents on buildings one and two. The appearance of the building is reserved for future approval. However, this is an illustrative plan of how the buildings may appear. Next slide, please, Kim. And this is another illustration of how the buildings may appear. So this is looking north towards the application site and the application site is in the center. Uh, looking east towards the application site, again, the application site in the center. Uh, looking south and looking west. So the photograph on the left is looking towards the railway line from the application site. The photograph on the right is looking towards Homer Road um, toward from within the application site. These pictures are within the application site looking towards Consort House. And finally, this picture is taken from Homer Road looking towards the application site with Consort House on the right. The main issues relevant to the assessment determination of this application are set out in detail in the committee report. For the reasons outlined in the report, your office has concluded that the overall planning balance is in favour of the application. The application is therefore recommended for approval, subject to conditions and the completion of a Section 106 agreement to secure a contribution to support off-site affordable housing provision. Thank you. Thank you, Matt. We don't have any speakers on this item, uh, so it's my responsibility to start the debate. The Council's standing orders require me to move the motion. Although I'm moving the motion, I'm still undecided on how I'll vote. Do I have a second? Do I have a second? Councillor Cole, thank you. Um, Matt, could you, could you answer me a question, please, that, that came up in your presentation? Um, you, can you just tell me you met i think you mentioned an extant planning application um for the car park is that correct that is chair um there is a permission that is extant but hasn't been implemented at this time um on the multi-story car park which was annotation i think it was annotation c um which is extant but hasn't commenced at this time 
Thank you. Um, the reason I ask the question, I'm sure, is, is, is pertinent in that um, the if you were looking to purchase one of these apartments, there may be some kind of management agreement to to use a car park. If, however, the car park were um, to be replaced with um, uh, further properties, we don't know, um, that could be uh, uh, quite a difficult situation in terms of uh, resident parking. Uh, I, and I accept that um, it is very close to the bus station, it's very close to the railway station, um, it's very close to the town centre. So in a way, it's um, it's got a lot of things ticking for you, boxes tick for you. If you're not a vehicle owner, um, the problem is, of course, that uh, we see further people wishing to buy vehicles, whether they be um, of a traditional fuel source or, 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 or electric. Um, members, um, Councillor Butler. Thank you, Chairman. Um, yes, uh, I'll, I'll reflect what the uh, what what the Chairman was just saying about the um, the parking spaces. Obviously, uh, you know there there is a uh, I have some concerns o o over that um, the the amount there. I think we, we the, the the original uh, number of properties has dropped by. Well, the original number of units has dropped by, I think, nine, but the but the parking provision has halved. Um, and the, the on, on page seventy nine, it details the the amount of trips that that people will be taking, that residents will be taking. And it says that the, the proposed seventy two apartments could generate approximately sixteen two way trips during AM and nineteen during the PM period. I mean, to me, uh, you know, from, if you like, from a layman's point of view, I think that that's quite a quite an optimistic number to think that seventy-two apartments, are, you know, only sixteen of them are, are, are going to use a car in the morning. Effectively, is what that's is what that's saying. Um, I, yeah, I, I think that may that may be a little optimistic, and I'm just concerned about um, it, it, where where are people going to park. Um, it, it, the idea of, of, of us all being able to use public transport is is great, um, and, and that's you know what, what partially we're striving for. But but not everyone can due to where they work, etc. Uh, people have children, take to school, so on and so forth. So uh, I have concerns over the amount of parking um, uh, and the amount of trips that have been calculated, Chairman. Thank you. Um... I, I do, I'll reiterate that I do think that it is in a very accessible place. And I think this is a matter of balance between um, a property in the centre of a wonderful town um, and um, being a driver. I, I, I no. I, my personal opinion at the moment is that the scales are weighing slightly more in favour of development um, because, of course, we need houses, we need properties. Um, people who wish to get on the uh, housing ladder is extremely difficult. Um, I think this type of property it, it could be, um, and certainly I know with my own son, um, he's got friends who have bought properties, you know, his peers who bought properties uh, in that particular area already um, and are looking to move out of there in a few years' time when they've got some more money put together. So I, I think it is um, unbalanced from a, a personal point of view in favour of approval rather than the other way. Um, any other members wish to speak? Councillor Gore. Yes, Chair, I'll be very brief. Um, I do share some of the concerns about parking 
Uh, however, you know, I do appreciate that this is, uh, you know, city centre, you know, uh, or town centre, you know, prime real estate, and we, we do have limited uh, land available. And I think it's a, a pretty good uh, use of, um, of land in, inside the city centre. So, I, you know, my concerns about the parking, uh, like the chairman said, you know, they, they certainly wouldn't uh, sway it enough for me to not be happy with this application. So I do welcome the application and I will be supporting it. Thank you, Chair. Thank you, Councillor Allen. Thank you, Chairman. Um, yeah, I think the general sort of uh, trend at the moment um, for uh, developments in city centres and uh, big towns like uh, Solihull is to um, sort of reduce parking. Uh, I mean, if you go down to London, you'll be very lucky if you get a parking, uh, get, get a garage. Um, and I think the idea is, I mean, they're one and two bedroomed apartments, so I think they would attract um, uh, single people, young people. And um, so um, I I'm not too worried about it because I, um, I think that is how the, uh, how the whole trend for cars and everything else is going now. Thank you. Councillor Cole. Thank you, Chair. Um, yes, I, I, I like this proposal. I'm actively trying to get residents in my ward to use public transport more, and this is an ideal opportunity to introduce people back into using public transport. It's in a central location. Brilliant. You've, you've got local transport hubs nearby. I think it's got it all going for them, Chair. Thank you. Councillor Davis. Basically, I'm in favour of the application, but I, I also wish to come back to the parking. This is what I used to call Prescott thinking. That was, if you give people a bus stop, a train station and what have you outside, they're not going to want a car. That doesn't happen. Never has. And even if petrol went up to £2 a, a litre or whatever it's heading at the moment, people will still want cars wherever they live. Um, it's just the parking spaces. If, if this had come in and said that the applicants come to an, uh, an arrangement with the owner of that multi-storey car park next door, then that would have been great. But it's, it, it isn't, and we have to make a decision based on what's in front of us. I think I can partly answer that, uh, Councillor Davis, in that um, it may well be um, that within the lease agreement there, or, or within the agreement, uh, the purchase agreement, um, there could be some kind of management fee for use of car park, which is what I tried to suggest and why I asked the question about the extant planning permission for the car park. Um, we don't know that, and it is not a planning matter anyway. So I'm going to move to the vote, um, if I may. Um, the recommendation is one of approval subject to conditions and the completion of an S106 agreement. Those in favour, please show. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. Unanimous, Chairman. Thank you. That's approved. The next item on our agenda is um, 134 Whitney Lane pages 109 and 118, but members will notice that there is a further application, agenda item 15, um, on pages 119 and 126. I intend to take both of these uh, agenda items together. However, at the end, we will be taking a separate vote on each one. Um, John, over to you. Thank you, Chair. Planning application and an application for listed building consent have been submitted for various alterations and extensions to this listed building that involve alterations to fenestration, internal alterations, the reduction in size of an existing garage to allow for rear access to the garden, and a replacement single-storey rear extension. Although no objections to the proposal have been received, uh, both applications are being considered by the planning committee because the applicant is related to a senior member of the development management team. So if I can just run through the proposed plans, please, Kim. Right, this is the site location plan. You can see the property 
Um, it's um, within an established residential area. It's Whitney Lane. Um, to the rear is the primary school, um, but it sits amongst uh, existing properties, occupying quite a large plot. Next slide, please, Kim. Now, these are all helpfully laid out that show uh, the existing uh, alongside the proposed. So the site plan to the left shows the existing uh, position on site. The site plan to the right shows the proposed. The two key things that you'll see from this is if you look to the garage to the rear and left of each, uh, it's reduced on the plan to the right. Um, also, the internal use of that room is changing as well and the fenestration changes. And you can also see more centrally on the plan to the left, there's a black hatched uh, extension that is being uh, removed and being replaced with that that is shown in red on the plan to the right. So that's the, the rear extension. Next plan, please, Kim. This shows the alterations to the front. Uh, you can see a key alteration to the, uh, well, the, the, the drawing to the top is the existing, the drawing to the bottom is proposed. To the right hand side, you can see a ground floor garage door being replaced with a much more in keeping uh, casement window. That is a big plus, a big positive, reinstating the character of this historic building. And then to the left, you can see the alterations to what was the, uh, the garage to the side and rear. This shows the rear elevation, again, existing to the top, proposed to the rear. You can see the various alterations to fenestration. You can also centrally see the change to the rear extension. That's right. Next slide, please. This is one of the existing side accesses, uh, side elevations, rather. Again, you can see changes to uh, fenestration, uh, but nothing more from this one. And next slide. Again, changes to fenestration, uh, very, very limited in its uh, amount and, uh, and, and detail. We now have a series of uh, floor plans. So this is the existing ground floor plan. Next slide, please, Kim. Existing first floor plan. Next slide, please. Existing roof plan. Next slide, please. This is the proposed floor plan. Uh, this is the proposed uh, first floor plan. And the next slide is the proposed roof plan. We now move on to some photographs. So this is the property from the front. Next slide, please, Kim. Uh, again, this is showing more detail of the garage door that is being removed and that does form one of the key benefits um, on this prominent front elevation, replacing it with a casement window that probably would have originally been there. Next slide, please. This is the garage element to the rear and left that I've referred to as being reduced. Next slide, please. This is the view from the neighbouring property directly to the left when viewed from the street, showing that there'd be no additional impact on that property. Any impact, which is very limited at the moment, will be reduced. And we have some aerial shots. Um, you can see the property there, taking up the full screen. Next slide, please. That's it. So. The key issues relevant to the assessment and determination of these applications are set out in the reports and the recommendations are set out therein are ones of approval subject to conditions. Thank you, Chair. Thank you, John. Um, there are no speakers on this item or on these items. It's my responsibility to start the debate. The Council standing orders require me to move the motion. Although I'm moving the motion, I'm still undecided on how I'll vote. Do I have a seconder? Councillor Davis, thank you. Members, do you wish to debate this, Councillor Davis, and then Councillor Gough? Just a quick observation, Chairman. I think the proposals are very much in keeping with the, uh, with the property, and it's nice to see that it's going to be... Uh, should we say refurbished and uh, look forward to seeing the uh, completion. Councillor Goff. Thank you, Chair. Uh, what I was about to say has already been said. Thank you there. <laughs> no, I, I mean very much. Your, your thunder has been well and truly stolen. Absolutely. No, I'm, ve I'm very but, much in support of the application. Okay. I, I, I'm going to head straight to the vote, members. Um, I think this is actually an enhancement. So um, uh, those in the the first one is application PL 2021-02986. Uh, its recommendation is for approval subject to conditions. Those in favour, please show. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. Unanimous, Chairman. The second application is um, 
application PL202103106. Those in uh, the, the recommendation is approval, so the condition. Those in favour, please show. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. Unanimous, Chair. Both items are therefore approved. Thank you very much indeed. The next item on our agenda is um, Hampton Court, 55 Marsh Lane, Hampton in Arden, uh, commencing on page 141 of your papers, members. Uh, John, it's the John Hallam show tonight so far. You'll be pleased to note, Chair, this is the last time you'll hear from me this evening. So, uh, uh, planning permission is sought to convert part of the roof space of the existing building to form a single residential apartment. External alterations relate to the insertion of several small and well designed and proportioned dormer windows, together with other openings and a balcony in the fabric of the building. So, if I can just run you through the proposed plans. Next slide, please, Kim. Here's the site location plan. It's hard to see from there, but uh, that the next slide will show a bit better. It's an E-shaped building, like capital E, uh, adjacent to the railway. Next slide, please, Kim. This one does show a bit more clearly. You can see the roof there. You can clearly see the form of, uh, of the building. And it's currently used uh, as residential apartments, albeit over two floors, not in the roof space. Next slide, please, Kim. Uh, another view of the property where you can see the red line and the little red dot concentrating on the central stalk of the capital E. It's that general area of the roof space that is looking to be uh, altered and converted to form the additional apartment. Next slide, please, Kim. Now, this is a roof plan showing what well, to the top is the existing roof plan. The middle one shows the proposed uh, fenestration within the roof plan to provide that internal accommodation. They are uh, small uh, hoop topped dormer windows uh, and then the bottom plan shows the internal uh, layout uh, of the flat. Next slide please. The top drawing shows the existing front elevation. The drawing under that shows the alterations that from the front you can see there's two dormer windows either side of that central gabled element and on the gabled element itself there is a balcony uh, access through a new opening. You'll see there's existing balconies uh, below and uh, to either end as well that serve existing properties that, that overlook as this will the, the communal areas uh, of the property. To the rear you'll see um, uh, that the third drawing down is the existing rear elevation. The fourth one down is the proposed and again you can see the two small dormer window set into the roof slope there as well. Next slide please, Kim. Now this sort of concentrates on the elements around the central stalk as I described it of the capital E that's to be converted in a bit more detail. You can see the dormer windows there, you can see the balcony and the opening onto it. Um, and this clearly shows that the dormer windows are of an appropriate scale uh, and sympathetic appearance very, very small in appearance and set well within the roof slope to respect the character and general uh, design of the existing building. Next slide, please. These are the end elevations um, of the proposal that, that show no changes, of the, of the building rather, that show no changes at all. Next slide, please. We have a series of sections now um, that show the same levels of changes um, that you've seen in the elevations, but just uh, split for in internal uh, purposes. So next slide, please, Kim. It's a similar one. And then we move on to the parking layout drawing. So this shows the existing parking layout at the side. You can see the existing parking spaces with the bin store and the cycle store adjacent to it. The next slide will show that the two dead spaces towards the end that aren't capable of accommodating a car are to be slightly extended uh, to allow for two extra parking spaces to uh, meet the needs of the uh, future occupiers if approved of this uh, of this development. Next slide please, we move on to a series of photographs. That is the central stalk of the capital E, the blue dots are where the uh, dormer windows will go when viewed from that angle. Also that points out where the, the balcony will go as well. You can see the existing balconies on the flats below. Um, this shows the other side of the, uh, the central front gable, so the other side of the, uh, the central stalk, um, and shows the other half of the compartment complex as well. 
as does the next photo, but the other side. So on to the next, please, Kim. That's it. So the key issue is relevant to the assessment and determination of this application as set out in the report, and the recommendation is one of approval subject to conditions. Thank you, Chair. Thank you, John. Uh, again, no speakers. It's my responsibility to start the debate. The Council is telling all the requirement to move the motion. Although I'm moving the motion, I'm still undecided on how I'll vote. Can I have a seconder? Councillor Davis, thank you. Members? Councillor Butler. Thank you. Just a quick one. It, it, where it's, uh, it talks about in objection, uh, the list of objections, it says in breach of landlord's covenants in terms of lease. Is that a legal issue, or does that prevent does that present an issue to us? Or Aisha, that's not planning consideration for yourselves. No one else has indicated they wish to speak, so therefore I'll go straight to the vote. Um, the recommendation is one of approval subject to conditions. Uh, those in favour, please show. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. Unanimous, Chairman. Thank you. That's approved. Um, we're slightly ahead of uh, what was scheduled, but uh, I'm now going to, as we've sat here um, diligently for the last two hours solid, um, I'm proposing to adjourn um, the meeting uh, for a, a brief interval. It's now showing just after seven o'clock on the Chamber's clock, so we'll reconvene at 7.30. Is that, or do we have to go on till? Can we not move that forward? Whilst we are adjourned for an interval, at least until 7.30, I don't wish to waste members' time. Can someone please determine if uh, all speakers uh, we'll be here by 7.30, even if they're not. Thank you. We're adjourned until at least 7.30, um, and I'll announce something at 7.30. Thank you.
members officers uh we are live now um in light of the fact that we have advertised Cheswick Green um, to commence at eight, 8 o'clock in the evening, I propose to bring forward the three applications for the Green um, starting shortly, um, purely in the fact that there are no registered speakers, merely uh, one speech that is to be read out, which I'm sure Mr. Acton has, has got. So therefore, um, I'll recommence formally the, the meeting um, and uh, to consider the application uh, of the Green Stratford Road on pages 223 to 242 of your agenda. Becky, I know it's you. Over to you. Thank you. Thank you, Chairman. So looking at the first application, this application seeks consent for the variation of the planning permission approved under application reference number PL 2018-02731. M-A-J-F-O-T. And it seeks to substitute the approved plans for the Nissan car dealership and replace with this with, this, with a new proposed Land Rover dealership and associated changes. The principle of development of this part of the site for the car dealership has therefore been established via the approved planning permission, as mentioned previously. Having regard to the proposed changes, it's considered that the, the design and layout is acceptable in terms of the scale, design and appearance of the building, and it's not dissimilar in scale to the previous approval. The development has been designed to prevent any undue overlooking, overshadowing or overbearing effect to the amenities of nearby and future residents and businesses. And, it's, and they're considered to be adequately safeguarded. The main building has been moved further away from the boundary with properties on Shepherd's Green Road and the proposal would provide for additional landscaping on the perimeter of the site to soften its appearance, including the provision of 18 new trees within the application site along the side and rear boundaries. And it's important to note that there's currently no trees on this part of the site. In terms of other matters, namely ecology, noise, lighting and drainage, no material impacts have been identified that cannot be dealt with via suitably worded conditions. And in addition, a green infrastructure payment is required of £19,537.91 to be secured via Section 106. The applicant has submitted information demonstrating that there's sufficient parking provided within the site for staff and visitors, and also demonstration cars um, and display cars. Um, and subject to conditions, the Council Highway Engineer is satisfied the proposal would not cause any undue highway safety implications. Plans have been provided that indicate the movement of transporters through the site, which follow similar movement patterns as those previously approved using the secondary access on Shepherd Green Road to leave the site. This was accepted under the previous Nissan approval and is deemed acceptable under this application. Therefore, having regard to all material considerations, the recommendation is one of approval subject to conditions and signing up to a Section 106 agreement. I'll just take you through the plans. Uh, so here you can see the red line is the um, outline of the application site we're looking at under this application. To the north of that is blue, um, the blue line, which is uh, land which is in the ownership of the um, developer in this instance and is subject of the next two applications, which I'll take you through after we've debated this one. Uh, next slide, please. OK, so this shows the red outline of the hybrid application, which I mentioned, the 2018 one. The area which we're looking at here contains the um, sort of N-shaped TRW building, which is just accessed off the main roundabout off Stratford Road, and then some smaller buildings to the um, southeast of that. Uh, just to let you know, if you've been there recently, most of that building isn't there anymore because they are currently demolishing it. If we go on to the next slide, please. Uh, this just sets out uh, what plot four, um, the, sort of the main part of plot four is, um, and it's a parameters plan. If we go on to the next slide, please. Okay, so this sets out the site, um, the layout of the site. The main building um, sits within sort of that larger part of that L-shaped block. Uh, so it's um, the orange sections are sort of the servicing MOT areas, and then you can see there's a wash bay which sits on the left. 
um, and then above those orange areas are sort of the internal parts of the main building um, where there would be offices and demonstration vehicles. Next slide, please. This is the elevations. The third one down is the front elevation, which would be visible off Stratford Road. Um, if you look at the bottom, you can see there's an access ramp. The access ramp would take you up onto the roof of the building, and that is where staff and demonstration sort of um, backstock vehicles would be housed. Those aren't going to be visible within the sort of wider public area because there is a parapet roof on that section. If we go on to the next slide. OK, this is just the ground floor of the building in a bit of greater detail, showing you how the cars would be stored within the site and then the service area again in orange. Next slide, please. Uh, and this is the mezzanine area within the building, which would be sort of the back office area. Next slide, please. OK, this is a section through, so you can see the cars on the roof. And then either side of that, there's um, a parapet wall, which means that those cars wouldn't be visible from the public vantage points. Next slide, please. Uh, this shows the car parking spaces within the site. Each colour is indicative of the different type of use of those spaces. So demonstration vehicles um, are the dark orange, the sort of pinky colour are the demonstration vehicles. Um, it's not demonstration vehicles, sorry, cars for sale. The greeny blue bit is visitor parking. Um, and then the blue and the yellow is staff and backstock. Next slide, please. This just shows the elevations of the wash bays. Next slide, please. Okay, so this plan shows the transporter routes through the site. On the left hand side is the um, approved Nissan dealership, and that shows that transport is slightly different in this instance. So transporters could come in and turn out throughout the site and enter off the top part of Shepherd's Green Road, but it also indicates that they could access out of the secondary access onto Shepherd's Green Road. And then on the right hand side, that is the Land Rover, which again does the same route, it just doesn't have the option of revolving around the um, building, and they would come out onto Shepherd's Green Road at the south. Next slide, please. Okay, so this is the uh, plan indicating trees. Um, hopefully, Kim will be able to just indicate on there where the site is, and there are no trees within this application site. To the south of the site, there is a um, green walkway, which was approved under the hybrid application. Those trees are retained. There's no impact on those trees. Um, but just to make you aware, there is a condition in relation to lighting, which Ecology have requested, just to ensure that any lighting within the site doesn't impact on the potential for bat roosting within those trees. Uh, next slide, please. And this is a landscaping plan. Sorry, it's not the clearest, but you can see on the right hand side, there's a green strip of landscaping. And then also to the south of the site, there's further landscaping provision. And the site provides for 18 new trees. And as I've said before, there's currently no trees on that site. So that is considered to be a really good betterment on the site. Next slide, please. OK, now I'll take you through the photos. Uh, so this is taken from Shepherd's Green Road, just as you come off the roundabout off Stratford Road. And you can see the existing access, which would provide entry into the site, is currently in situ already. And then in the distance, you can see the properties on Shepherd's Green Road. Next slide, please. This shows the properties on Shepherd's Green Road on the left, and then the application site is on the right. Next slide, please. This is taken from what would be the rear of the site, and that tree there would be the first tree within the green walkway. And you can see in the distance there is the Audi garage. If you're familiar with that part of Shirley, you'll know it is basically the hub for all of the car dealerships. Next slide, please. Uh, this is just another shot with the properties on Shepherd's Green Road on the right hand side, application site on the left. Next slide, please. And this is taken from the opposite side of Stratford Road, looking towards the application site. And you can see on the sort of right hand side of that photo, that is the remaining half of the TRW building. Next slide, please. And that's it. Thank you, Chairman. Thank you, Becky. Uh, we do have a written statement uh, from 
uh, Anthony Endor as an objector. Uh, David, could you uh, get a read it, please? Thank you. The summary of objection. The secondary entrance to the site originally shown in application 2018-02731 is significantly altered in use and may not be considered secondary, causing significant impact on residents of Shepherd's Green Road in this application. The approved site plan shows the intended scope of secondary entrance, parking spaces indicated in frequent use, the footpath continued across the entrance and transport vehicles could lap the site and vacate through the main entrance. This application, 202103190, upgrades the secondary entrance to the same status as primary entrance and should be considered a second, not a secondary entrance. Usage changes from occasional to permanent. Expected behaviours. <clears throat> the entrance will be used exclusively for workshop activities, road tests, issue diagnosis, repair confirmation, PDI activities, pre-MOT checks and servicing. All extra traffic will be within residential section of Shepherd's Green Road. Transporters often offload vehicles on road rather than site. Workshop location means ease and good deliveries likely favour parking opposite 9 to 19 Shepherd's Green observed at Birmingham, Audi and Toyota. Site design encourages natural unidirectional flow, despite both entrances being two-way. Customer and staff traffic naturally follow the path indicated for car transporter in the drawings, treating the primary entrance as the entrance and the secondary entrance as the exit. Customers test drive vehicles likely to exit the site via the second entrance. Justifications for objection. Residents sold homes with plans showing occasional, occasional use of secondary entrance not used by staff, customers or the workshop. Very significant increase in traffic along residential stretch of Shepherd's Green Road affecting 1 to 21 Shepherd's Green Road. Increased traffic, increased risk to children in particular. Increased traffic and parked HGVs, increased pollution, chemical noise outside homes. Parked HGVs restrict the parking, visibility and diverts traffic to the wrong side of the road. Crashes and danger to children increases. Workshop activities using the second entrance are more hazardous. Assessing vehicles using faults or undertaking repairs, i.e. virgin brake pads, drivers are or should be fully trained but should be undertaken away from residential areas. Significant privacy, degradation for residents. Traffic rises from occasional transporter to every transporter, plus goods delivery. All workshop activity and half of all customer and sales staff journeys. Residents face constant flow of strangers looking into their homes. Significant risk of more dangerous driving. Prestigious high performance vehicles can encourage less considerate driving. Potential customers not familiar with the vehicle attributes make errors more likely, particularly braking, accelerating performance, steering, speed and large turning circles. Recommendations. Use of the site to reflect plan outlined in original application. Entrance remains secondary exit as originally planned. If impossible for the car transporter, recognising this is no small task, all customers, staff, sales and workshop Activities must be directed through the main entrance. Barrier must remain closed unless HGVs exiting the site. Significantly increased tree planting along the site border to mask dealership and improve privacy for residents. Also discourages use of the secondary entrance. No branding near secondary entrance that emphasises dealership or access to it. And finally, gates should be attractive, not chain link keeping with the aesthetic of site developments. And that ends the statement. Thank you. Thank you, David. Um, I allowed it to continue um, in fairness as it was a written statement, um, but uh, that did take four minutes uh, and not three minutes for noting in the future, but potentially. Um, 
Okay, uh, it's my responsibility to start the debate. The Council standing orders require me to move the motion. Although I'm moving the motion, I'm still on decided on how I'll vote. Do I have a second, please? Councillor Davies, thank you. Uh, members, any? Councillor Allen. Thank you, Chairman. Um, Mr. Andor's recommendations look okay. What is there any reason why we couldn't accept them? Okay, I'll just answer that bit now. Um, so if we go back to the Nissan approval that had two accesses, which are in the same location as these accesses, um, and therefore the context and setting of these accesses is identical. Um, if I'm not sure if Kim could just pull up and zoom in on that slide, which had both sitting next door to it. So the secondary access, as I said, is the same. The Nissan one did demonstrate that there would be the potential to store some vehicles in front of that but there was nothing to say they couldn't use that access on a daily basis and keep it open. And they have advised and indicated on the plan, which is just coming up in a second, that transporters could and would at times go through that. And therefore it is unreasonable to now um, sort of restrict the use of that. If we just, I'll just hopefully the plan will just show that in a bit more detail, yeah. So, yeah, can you zoom in on the left-hand side of the... Yeah, that one. So this is the Nissan approval, which shows the secondary access. The pale blue shows a transporter coming in and out of that secondary access. If we move over to what Land Rover want to do, it's exactly the same. And the um, highways are satisfied that a transporter can exit that part of the site um, without resulting in any danger to um, sort of occupants of Shepherd's Green Road. Also, it's important to note that um, the application was a hybrid application. It's always been intended for there to be a car dealership on this site. Councillor Butler. Thank you, Chairman. Um, I, I'm, I'm, now that's been explained, I'm, I'm satisfied with uh, with that. I mean, uh, in essence, you know, there's a lot of there's a lot of houses going on there, um, but coming off the Stratford Road, if if a, if a, a, a transporter or a, a vehicle from that dealership uses that second entrance, they're, they're it, from my reckoning, they're, they're going to pass about six houses before they go in so um looking at the site as a whole it doesn't seem to be that that Im impactive um the only thing that i'd be mindful of is 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 obviously vehicles coming out of there and turning right and and going through the site now towards dog kennel lane but i can't imagine that many would do that that, that they would be minded to go out of the, the main entrance so uh, in essence, I, I don't think there's there's too much of an impact there. But thank you, Chairman. Thank you. I can't see any other. Hand. Oh, sorry, Councillor Clements, I didn't see you indicate previously. Thank you, Chair. I've just got one question about the opening hours. Um, page two forty, um, item sixteen. It's just the opening hours seem to be seven a.m. in the morning to eight a.m. Or, or you know, for the planning that that it couldn't be. Um, outside of those hours, and also s Sundays, nine till five. Is that normal for a car dealership to be open those times? And if it was by residential houses, is there anything that members have got concerns over? Obviously, I obviously have, but I'd just like to hear what planning has to say. Yes, yeah, so those hours are, as per what was approved for Nissan, um, they're also in line with the neighbouring um, Audi dealership. Obviously, I appreciate seven o'clock in the morning seems quite early. That's likely to be for drop off for vehicles that are servicing and things like that. That's certainly what I do. Um, the one thing that I'd like to comment, um, nothing to do with planning really, but uh, I'm pleased to see uh, the applicant is for Land Rover, a local Solihull company, uh, rather than a 
a Japanese organisation. Um, so that uh, I like. Uh, I haven't seen any of the um, members put, indicate that they wish to speak, so I'm going to move straight to the vote. Um, the the uh, recommendation is approval subject to conditions and a and a S106 legal agreement. Those in favour, please show. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. Unanimous, Chairman. That's approved. Next item is also at the green. Um, item 24. Uh, let me just check that. 03191. Uh, yes, it's 2425, um, starting on page 257 of your uh, papers. Uh, uh, again, Becky. Thank you, Chairman. So this application seeks full planning permission for the development of a self-storage facility, including 27 parking spaces, yard, cycle shelter, smoking shelter, landscaping, access and associated works and ancillary office space. The principle of development of this part of the site for commercial uses, which were granted outline cons consent, was approved under the previous hybrid application, which granted consent for the use of the site for car dealerships. Under the outline part of the hybrid permission, this set out a maximum height for car dealerships in this location of 16.75 metres. The proposed storeroom building would have a maximum height of 12.5 metres with a small section within the roof, which would be the lift over run that would increase to 13.3 metres in height. The relationship between the proposed storeroom and the Land Rover um, car dealership adjacent is respectful. The scale, mass and bulk of each building is comparable and therefore would appear as good neighbours to one another within the street scene. Turning to the design of the building, it would be predominantly square in footprint and treated with a flat roof, clad in grey panelling with a large central section of glazing to the front elevation, which would provide a display window and light into the building. It's considered that this would break up the front elevation to provide activity to the elevation that is most visible from the public vantage points. The side elevations of the building would remain blank, um, apart from the side elevation facing onto the boundary of the proposed residential element, which we will assess under the next application, which would have glazing at ground floor and would provide light and visibility to internal areas of the building to be used as offices, greeting points and cafe areas. Officers have worked with the developer throughout the lifetime of the application and amended plans were submitted which addressed urban designers' initial comments in relation to the provision of the bin store and smoking shelter and plant and machinery area. Additional tree planting around the site and PV provision on the building have also been included and it should be noted that the developer intends to provide PVs across the entirety of the roof of the building. The proposed plant and machinery area has been relocated to the side of the building and would sit between the building and Land Rover and the smoking shelter and cycle store at the front of the site have been located in an area with tree planting to screen those from public view as far as possible. Having regard to the scale and design of the neighbouring of the neighbouring proposed um, residential unit, it is considered that the two buildings would not have a detrimental impact on each other in terms of loss of light or overbearing impact. The residential development next door, which will be assessed under the other application, only includes a proposed indicative layout. However, it does demonstrate that there is sufficient separation between the storeroom and any neighbouring residential units um, to avoid as appearing as overdominant, and there are no concerns regarding loss of privacy. The site currently has no trees planted within it, and the submitted proposals include plans demonstrating landscaping to include new tree planting of 16 trees to the front of the site and the side boundary in order to soften its appearance when viewed from Stratford Road and the potential neighbouring residential development. To the rear of the site is the um, land intake of the car dealership, which has just been approved, and that boundary is intended to be bolstered further with additional fencing and landscaping to ensure a strong and secure boundary, which offers a transition towards the open green space and green walkway to the south of the site. Turning to ecology, um, it is considered that um, a net gain of biodiversity on site can be achieved. This is subject to the provision of four additional trees, which will run alongside the site boundary. And in a minute, I will draw your attention to where those will be located. Furthermore, conditions in relation to lighting are proposed to protect bat roosting potential of trees to the south of the site. 
The drainage team have raised no objections to the proposal and the public protection have requested a condition in relation to the submission of a noise and vibration assessment to be submitted prior to the use of the building to ensure that the development is sensitive to the potential neighbouring use of residential development to the north of the site. Having regard to all of the material considerations, the application is recommended for approval subject to conditions. So here on the slide, you can see the red line application site. To the south of that is the Land Rover, which would wrap around, and that's just being indicated there at the moment. If we go on to the next slide. This shows the site area with the existing buildings, which have actually now been demolished over the last couple of weeks. If we go on to the next slide. This shows the footprint of the building. You'll see it does occupy the majority of the site with um, the proposed parking area to the frontage of the site. There is also the 16 trees that you can see there. So they run alongside the boundary on the west and then the north. The very north um, western corner is where the proposed cycle shelter and smoking shelter is. And then on the um, eastern boundary is the new plant area, which is moved from the front of the site. Yes, yeah, just there. Uh, if we go into the next slide, okay, this one shows you can see the green area there. That's where the four trees, which are proposed to be um, planted in order to secure um, net biodiversity gain. Go on to the next slide. Okay, so here you can see the elevation. The top elevation is the front elevation, which would face onto Stratford Road. And then I believe that's the side elevation. Yep, that's the side elevation where you can see the glazing at ground floor level, and that would sit alongside the boundary with the residential development. Next slide, please. This is the other side in the rear elevation. Next slide, please. This just shows the ground floor plan in a little bit more detail. So the blue is any storage area, walkways, etc. And then the pink area is where it's proposed to have sort of, it's, they term it a cafe, it's not. It's just where there'll be like vending machines, ability to get coffee when you're working there and things. Next slide, please. Uh, this just shows the first floor of the proposed development. Next slide, please. And this shows how um, PVs could be accommodated within the roof space. And as I said, it is proposed for almost the entirety of that roof to be covered in PVs. Next slide, please. And this is probably the best image to show you how it would sit um, within the context of the site. So the left of that would be the Land Rover building, then you'd have the storeroom. And then on the right hand side, that is showing the existing TRW building, which has been demolished now. Next slide, please. Okay, here you can see this is taken from the opposite side of Stratford Road. You've already seen this one. There's half of the TRW building. This storeroom would pretty much sit to the left of that. Next slide, please. That's the existing access point, which would be shared with Land Rover. You would go in that, turn left to Land Rover, right to the storeroom. Next slide, please. Okay, this is taken from that access point, looking back towards um, the... TRW building, which you can just see. In the, and then in the very far distance is the uh, residential care home of Restful Homes. Next slide, please. And this is just taken um, from that oak walkway, green walkway that I mentioned. Next slide, please. And this is just a closer photo showing you can see Restful Homes there and then the TRW building. And I think that's the last photo. Thank you, Chairman. Thank you, Becky. Um, there are no speakers or representations on this application. Therefore, it's my responsibility to start the debate. The Council standing orders require me to move the motion. Although I'm moving the motion, I'm still undecided on how I'll vote. Do I have a seconder? Councillor Davies, thank you. Uh, members, over to you. And let, uh, you Councillor Butler. Thank you. Um, th there are several um, self-storage businesses around that area. Uh, some are in uh, the Cranmore Industrial Estate. And I, I, I've got two units that I use at the moment. And from uh, my own experience, that they allow 24-hour access. Um, but about 50% of the customers that use these self-storage units are businesses. And they tend to arrive in either lorries or transit vans. It makes it really problematic. Now, that's a problem when you've got 24-hour access. 
this doesn't have 24 hour access this has uh, working day hours so what we're going to do is, is we're going to end up condensing that traffic into a, a smaller time frame um i'm just wondering if any consideration has been has been given to this factor because the the, the parking spaces that, that we've got planned are for cars um and we have to take into account that that about 50 percent are going to be lorries vans etc um do we have any thoughts about that issue I will refer to highways to see if they've got any comments in terms of the storeroom and the business model they've put forward to us the majority of their occupants do tend to be um, small startup businesses so we would expect them to be traveling in in the smaller vehicles but also it does offer an element of sort of you can open up your storage unit and use it as an office facility as well so an office base if you're not able to work from home you could rent part of this building for that function um so it certainly isn't our opinion that there would be a significant number of large vehicles turning up on site at any one time um, and you'll note that in terms of the operating hours they are far shorter than that 24-hour access really in order to be respectful to the character of the area Councillor Allen thank you chairman um just a quick question about the uh proposed residential development um, to the northwest of the site. You say that um, uh, that it is notable layout proposed uh, uh, regard to the proposed uh, sufficient separation between the storeroom and any neighboring residential units can be achieved to avoid it appearing as an over dominant building and there are no concerns regarding loss of privacy you say it can be can we be absolutely sure it is okay at this um, stage? we can't be absolutely sure it is at this stage because the residential development next door is proposed in outline so you'll see more details in that sense um, but in terms of loss of privacy there certainly wouldn't be any because the only windows to that side elevation are at ground floor level thank you um i can't see any other oh council clements here you have a slow hand Eric Clapton comes to mind. Thank you. Um, I'm just trying to find the use of materials on there because when we're looking at the actual picture, it looks like a big black box. And because it's next to residential area, is there anything that um, I'm looking for? I'm sure you normally say, you know, materials to be submitted, but have we got anything where we can soften the appearance a little bit to residents? Um, I'm just double checking, but yes, there should there is a um, condition, um, condition three on page two hundred and seventy one, which seeks approval of the materials. Um, it is likely to be a dark grey cladding. I appreciate it's hard on CGI images; they do tend to um, alter the colour a little bit. Um, but in terms of the use of grey cladding, we are satisfied that that would be acceptable in that location. Thank you. Um, I can't see any other hands being indicated, therefore I'll move to the vote. Um, the recommendation is one of approval subject to conditions and completion of an S106 agreement. Those in favour, please share. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. Unanimous, Chairman. Thank you. That's approved. So we now move on to the final uh, application on the green, which is 03201 on pages 301 to 338 uh, again becky thank you chairman so this application seeks outline consent for the development of up to 110 c3 residential dwellings with all matters reserved except for access and scale other matters in relation to layout landscape and appearance would come forward in a subsequent reserve matters application should the application be approved tonight the application site is allocated within the current local plan as part of a wider employment site. However, the principle of development of this part of the site for non-employment related uses was approved under the previous hybrid approval in 2018. And it should be noted that under the local plan review, it intends to remove this allocation from the site. 
Furthermore, it is noted that the Council cannot demonstrate a five-year housing land supply and the MPPF supports the use of sites for alternative uses where the sites are unable to suitably be used for their allocated use. Therefore, it is considered that the use of this site for housing is acceptable in this instance. Turning to access of the site, this would be gained via the internal estate road and highways have confirmed that this is acceptable. In terms of the scale of the development, a parameters plan has been supplied in conjunction with an illustrative layout plan. This shows how the up to 110 dwellings could be provided on the site, demonstrating blocks of apartments to the frontage of the site with a maximum height of 16.75 metres over three to five storeys. In terms of height, this is the same height as approved under the parameters plan from the hybrid, and given the neighbouring uses of the adjacent care facilities to the northwest and car dealerships and storeroom to the southeast, it is considered that the transition between the developments in terms of height would be acceptable. The height would then reduce to two to three storeys to the rear of the residential development site as it moves to the residential core of the green. In terms of the design of the dwellings, this is not for assessment at this time, but during the reserved matters submission, it would be expected that the design and appearance of the units has regard to the character of the area. Furthermore, the final layout of the scheme would be expected to be designed in a manner which protected the amenities of future and existing occupiers of the application site and neighbouring sites. In terms of affordable housing provision, the previous hybrid application set out a vacant building credit for the site of the green as a whole, with permission granted for up to 330 units. Based on the previous and currently outstanding applications for the hybrid residential area, not all of this up to 330 figure has been proposed to be built out, and therefore this represents a shortfall of the number of units implemented under the hybrid permission. The proposed development on plot four being assessed under this application seeks to absorb the shortfall and benefit from the remaining vacant building credit as already established and approved for the site as a whole. This would be up to a maximum of the shortfall of units, with the remaining units taking you up to the maximum of 110 being required to provide 40% affordable housing. This is set out within the section 106, which would accompany the application. And in addition to this, there's also an education contribution of £3,474 per unit for secondary school spaces, which would also be set out within the section 106. Landscaping remains one of the matters reserved under this application, but the site would be expected to provide sufficient public open space for the number of dwellings to be provided, and this would be finalised during assessment of the future reserve matters application. The plan submitted indicate the loss of 11 trees off the site, which would need to be adequately mitigated for. The landscape team had advised that they would expect that these trees could be adequately, mit adequately mitigated for within the site and satisfy the policy requirement for the provision of street trees. However, should there be a shortfall in provision on the site, this would be secured via section 106 for tree mitigation. Turning to ecology, an assessment of biodiversity net gain has been submitted, which indicates a baseline figure whereby a net gain can be achieved on site. The final details would be submitted at reserve matters stage along with the landscaping information. And should a net gain not be achievable at this stage, there is a mechanism within the section 106 to secure off-site mitigation. However, as I've said, we are fully expecting that there will be sufficient provision of additional trees within the site and that a net gain can be achieved. The drainage team have confirmed no objection to the scheme and would review further details at the time of submission of the reserve matters application to ensure that the site would adhere to SUD's drainage principles. Public Protection have reviewed the, reviewed the application and confirmed no objections subject to conditions to secure a construction method statement and management plan, as well as information in relation to noise and vibration to ensure the development would not be impacted by any neighbouring uses. In conclusion, it is considered that the development would be policy compliant and therefore a recommendation is one of a resolution of approval subject to conditions and signing up to a Section 106 agreement. If we just quickly go through the plans. Okay, so here we're looking at the application site outlined in red, and then to the south is the land uh, in blue, which is taken up by the storeroom and the car dealership. So you can see that this part of the site essentially occupies the land which is, was occupied by the TRW building. Next slide, please. So this is an indicative plan and covers, um, it also includes development which has been previously approved on the site and is subject to the future assessment under a final application. I just want to draw your attention to the dwellings which are shown along the rear of Blackford Road. They are indicative only. There is an application which is yet to be um, determined for those properties. Next slide, please. 
Okay, this is the parameters plan, which sets out that the frontage of the site would be up to 16.75 metres in height, which is equivalent to three to five storeys, and then that would drop down to two to three storeys. Next slide, please. Okay, here you can see the TRW building, and you can see the 11 trees which are currently on site. Uh, those are the trees which would need to be suitably mitigated for within the future development and would be looked at during the reserve matters application. Next slide, please. Okay, so this is the view from the opposite side of the Stratford Road. Next slide, please. Uh, this is the view down. You can see uh, the restful care home, which would sit adjacent to the application site. And then you can see the TRW building on the left hand side. Next slide, please. This is just another view down again. So you would, if you were looking down here, you would have Land Rover, then you would have the storeroom, then you would have the residential development. Next slide, please. And again, you've already seen this photo, that's just looking back into the site. That green walkway extends all the way from Shepherd's Green Road all the way up to um, that restful care home development. And adjacent to that is the McCarthy and Stone development. And there is an access route through both of those. And I think that's the last slide. Oh, this is just one more slide. OK, also on this slide, you can see the trees which are currently in situ on site. You'll see that those are young um, trees. They're not of any particular sort of um great size next slide please i think that's the last one yeah thank you chairman thank you becky we don't have any speakers on this application therefore it's my responsibility to start the debate council sending orders required to move the motion although i'm moving the motion i am still undecided on how i'll vote do i have a seconder Councillor Cole, thank you. Uh, members, any questions or officers? Or I don't see any um, particular urgency to debate. Therefore, um, I, I'm assuming that you're relatively content. Um, so I'll move straight to the vote. Um, the recommendation is one of approval subject to conditions and the completion of an S106 legal agreement. Those in favour, please show. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. Unanimous, Chairman. Thank you. That is approved. And uh, with slight apologies, we now move back to item 20 on our agenda, which is the application for Cheswick Green Primary School on pages 163 to 222 of our papers. Um, who's going to present that as you, Kim? Over to you. Thank you, Chairman. This application at Cheswick Green Primary School essentially seeks to extend and expand the school from a one-form entry primary school to a new two-form entry primary school. And in doing so, that would mean that the existing school children um, rise in numbers from the 270 pupils that are already at the school, and that would go up to 420 pupils. Of that, um, there would be 30 preschool children, and in my language, that's infant school children, if that helps you. And then um, there would be 60 nursery children attending the, the nursery there. Um, I'd like to take you through the background and then the slides, if I can. Um, this application is, is been looked at with extreme care by the planning team. <clears throat> and again, um, there has been an outcome of, of a tale of two cities. Um, on the one hand, there is real need for um, an extension to Cheswick Green Primary School. And the story starts back in March 2017, when the planning permission was issued for Blythe Valley Park. Blythe Valley Park, as members know, is a strategic site in our local plan. And that provided for a mix of developments, employment, other uses, but also residential. And 750 new homes were granted planning permission at that time. Um, the committee report back then acknowledged education um, and amongst other things. And it was very clear and it was clearly set out in the committee report that, Dicking, um, that Blythe Valley itself 
um, did not provide the scale and the quantum of residential development to, so to support a new primary school. And as a consequence to that, the legal agreement that was allied to the planning permission provided significant sums of money bespoke to Cheswick Green Primary School. It was it, those monies were intended to support the um, extension to it. Rolling forward, of course, um, there's, a, there's two um, statutory duties in, involved here. One is from our education department, um, the children's the cabinet member for children, education and skills, and they have a statutory duty to provide school places. Now, again, it was for that cabinet member to um, acknowledge and approve the extensions to Cheswick Green Primary School. And in doing so, um, the report demonstrates that three separate committee, uh, cabinet reports went to his decision-making process. They included looking at all the options, new school, existing schools, can, they, can others be developed or not? And again, the recommendation was there, clearly came back to an expansion to, to Cheswick Green. Um, and therefore, the planning application has been submitted to us. And in, in its assessment, it's clear that there is a, a very strong need for school places. Um, and I'd like to point out to members that are in, from a planning point of view, the MPPF does at paragraph 95 require um, the decision makers to put great weight, and I emphasise that point, great weight, to the need to expand or alter schools. And again, with all the, um, with the planning history, with the, um, and then the allied cabinet reports to education, it's very clear that that simply is the case. Um, and as a consequence, um, planning officers provide that substantial positive weight in the planning balance. Um, I'd, like to, I'd like to point out um, the planning balance in a tabular form that's within your planning papers. It's on page 166, and that shows you the two sides of, of, the, of the coin, the benefits in terms of planning weight and then the adverse impacts. So the planning in the benefits, I've talked about school expansion, and that has substantial positive weight. There is, of course, expanding any school, um, that requires job creation, um, not least for the construction, but also for the, um, for the staff at the school. And incidentally, there are 44 staff at the minute, and that would increase to 65 to support the, the increase in, in pupils. Um, there's also improved sports facilities, which again, I'll show you in, my, in the slide presentation. Um, on the negative side, however, um, any school has um, issues around traffic, and here in this example, um, the school is doubling in size. So quite clearly, um, highways is a significant issue here. So much so that on assessment, our highway authority, our, our highway engineer um, consultation, states that, the, that there is severe harm to the highway network and safety as a consequence of this development. So again, from a planning balance point of view, we're up there with, the, with the, um, education and then along comes highways. But as I say, the officer's planning balance is on page 166. Now, clearly, any application such as this requires mitigation from a highway point of view. And I'd like, like to point members um, if this is an important point, please. Um, in your update note, we make reference to a letter that the planning team have received from the Council's Director of Resources, um, and that letter provides um, a guarantee in perpetuity to the funding of some of the mitigation measures that I will put out. Um, stay with you now. So that, that in terms of deliverability of these um, mitigation, um, we have... We have comfort, we have um, a guarantee that this, is, that this can happen and, and can be funded going forward. OK, I'll take you through the slides and I'll talk a little bit more about mitigation. So we've got the school um, in the middle of the plan. You'll know by now that the red line site indicates the application that we're looking at. So this is the current school and this is its, its um, curtilage. You'll notice that there's a bit of a... The, application site actually extends quite a long way back. This is at the moment an agricultural field, but it is in the ownership 
of, of the school. And also um, there's a dotted line here and that provides for a new playing field that is proposed as part of the part of this development. Um, again, this is the existing block plan. I think the one thing I'd like to show you here is that is the existing nursery that is already located at the school. Um, again, the floor plans of the school and the existing elevations. You'll note that the school building is single storey, which again is an important point from, in terms of neighbour amenity. And here we have the proposed site plan. Now, I'd like to take you through this in, in a little more detail, just so that we can all kind of get an understanding of the scheme. So here is the existing access into the school site. Um, there's a pedestrian access here and the main vehicular access. At the moment, before the school is extended, um, there are 14 car parking spaces that, that are within the curtilage of the school. Um, this, this, this layout shows 40... 36 spaces. It shows 36 spaces, which is a big increase from the 14 existing, um, but that would serve the 65 staff. I'd li like to, dem to highlight that there is some tandem parking here at the frontage. Um, that is to make maximum use of, of land on the site for car parking. And that, of course, means that there's no staff. Um, it reduces any overspill parking from the school itself onto residential streets. There's a car park management plan, which is introduced with this um, proposal and is, is um, secured through condition to require that um, the management of those um, tandem spaces is dealt with carefully by the school so that there's no conflict in terms of people being boxed in when they need to leave so that the, the um, people will be matched up carefully. Um, clearly, as with any school, there's a secure site boundary across it. In this case, um, the site boundary will be bolstered quite significantly, mostly so towards the rear of the site. Um, we've had a landscaping scheme to provide additional tree planting all around this um, the, the perimeter of the site. It helps soften the experience and of course it demarcates this new playing field to the rear. And on that subject, this, this is the playing field, it's new. The existing two sports pitches, pitches to the school remain in situ. Um, but what has altered and is slightly altered by the scheme is the runoff to them. So the um, space outside of the courts, that's slightly reduced because of um, extension extensions to the school and as a consequence there is a qualitative and quantitative improvement in sports provision required by the um, by Sport England and we have here a new mugger so that's a multi-use games area. Um, the extensions to the buildings are here I've already shared that the new that the existing nursery is brought into the site um, the existing building retains here so it's all changed around the other side um, and that takes you through the site. Let me. And again, this this plan just shows in in more um, more of a plan form that those extensions. So that all the extensions are the rear of the site, and there's no amenity issues from it. The single story nature of the school is retained. Here's a floor plan of proposed. One of the um, positives that this scheme provides for is a rearrangement of classrooms and working facilities inside the school so it provides a better experience for staff and pupils and in terms of the elevation treatment it gives a refresh and a modernization to the school which is always welcomed um, our urban designers support the the scheme okay and then of course um coming to the I mentioned the site, the site, the application site is wider or deeper than it might be necessary, but that does provide a very important point. If planning permission is to be granted, there is um, a, a, a construction site compound here. So that would mean that all the construction works could be taken away from the public highways. It doesn't interfere with the existing school site and it would work very neatly together. It does require um, a new access here, which would be temporary um, for those vehicles to, to come into off, um, off Crenolds Lane. There's the landscaping plan. I've already shown you the, the trees and so on. Okay, we then move to the mitigation. So 
from a highways point of view, the existing school provides for 93 vehicle movements in the morning peak and 81 vehicle movements in the afternoon peak. That would actually grow to 195 vehicle movements in the morning peak and 157 vehicle movements in the afternoon peak. So quite clearly, there needs to be um, mitigation. And the mitigation um, comes in, I think there's seven areas of it. Um, I've already told you about the car parking management plan. Um, there will be a school travel plan as well, like a green travel plan for the school as a whole, not just, not just staff, but pupils too, um, that would be introduced and is conditioned. Importantly, a staggered start and end time to the school day is, is offered up, is, is provided as one of the mitigations. That's a 20 minute difference from um, in start times for different children to, in the school. Now clearly with that it means that the, um, the spill out of the school day is filtered through, but obviously there are going to be some children who have siblings in, that's ones in the early start and ones in the later start. So again, and this comes back to the um, update note, um, the school is to provide a free wraparound care and that covers this, um, this staggered start, start time. There will also be a free um, bus from a school bus from Blythe Valley Park. That bus will arrive at the first, the very earliest start time, and it will finish at the very latest. It will leave at the very latest um, kick out time at the end of the day. And again, all those people wanting to use the Blythe Valley bus can stay and wait for it in the um, in the wraparound care as as they see fit. Um, the school already has an out of school club. And again, that is to be increased in size so that 60 pupils can be accommodated there. Um, and then there is also the recommendation for a traffic regulation order, and that is what's, what's shown on the screen now. I recognise it's too small to, to view. Um, I have got some extensions, but here's the school. There's the existing access to it, and there are some changes um, proposed. Now, any TRO would need to go through its own consultation um, phase through the through the highways department. So at the moment, this is illustrative, but it gives a very clear right, clear um, indication of what can be done. So um, here we're looking at the higher end of Chiswick Way. The schools down to the um, east. And here we're having the proposed to be yellow lines um, across where you see the yellow on the road markings here. Um, there are a number of um, new street signage, um, no stopping signs, and again, that is um, for the targets, the morning and afternoon, morning drop-off and afternoon pick-up times. So there will be no stopping and no park, mock parking on um, Cheswick Way outside the school site. Um, moving closer to the school, so again, here is the school here. Um, Foxland Close um, is a bit of a dog's leg from the it's, um, from the school entrance. And here, um, I think this is a very clever and effective technique. It's proposed to tighten the junction. And by doing so, it would prevent cars from doing a U-turn and just using that junction to turn around and, and go back to, towards Crenolds Lane. Um, as with any school, there would be the, the zigzag road markings in front of it. But again, significantly, there's a new zebra crossing here. There isn't one currently on site. Um, and then again, there is the new um, road, road signs. The last thing to point out here is that um, the Blythe Valley bus, it obviously needs somewhere to park. And this is its designated parking space. Um, it does replace disabled parking. And there's, there's the end of the TROs. Um, also, there's a walking bus. Again, um, our resources director has guaranteed funding for that. If it doesn't become sustainable, the council will, will um, take over. And there are two routes. Um, one is this, I'm looking here at route A, and that takes us from Cheswick Way, and this is the heart of the village, into the school. The second one is, this is um, Cheswick Place. And Cheswick Place is a new development of housing, which again came about through the um, through a, a, a um, designation in the local plan. Um, again, to note this this um, this route does take um, the children 
through what is the um, the, the drainage land for the <coughs> for the site. Most of the year, this is dry. But in, in events of heavy rainfall, it may be wet underfoot. So again, that is something that um, we are mindful of and there will be a safety audit too. But this route, as per the second route, um, is about, for little children, it's about a 15 minute walk. And there will be three pickup spaces, um, place stops on the way through. Um, some pictures of the school site. So this is looking in from the entrance at Cheswick Way and again looking back the other way to the street. This is its um, main entrance and the canopies and they, they're retained. Um, this elevation faces out towards the, the existing playground. And then this is looking towards the sports pitches. You can see there's a goalpost up there. And again, this stays as is. Um, and again, looking down the other way. There will, of course, be a new mugger in, in this direction. This is the existing um, part of an existing play area to the to the current nursery or the you know the younger children at the school, and this is looking um, towards the new um, towards the existing standalone nursery, and this is a satellite image just to show the construction route, um, and that's that just puts that in there for construction traffic. Okay. And of course, we're coming now to photographs of the highway itself. Um, we've provided photographs from both from the applicant and from the parish council. So it's self-explanatory. This is in the morning with parking on Cheswick Way. And then again, in the morning, this is other um, road traffic on Cheswick Way. And obviously, you'll see here that there is a, a, um, a lorry that's been parked on the road and again um, next to it. And then in the morning, this has come from the parish council. You'll see that there's an, a, an array of different sorts of vehicles and it's busy. And another. And that um, ends the, the presentation. The officer's um, recommendation is approval, um, which is set out in your report, subject, of course, to the conditions too. Thank you. Thank you, Kim. Um, we have a number of speakers um, this evening on this uh, matter, and um, the first being Mr. Coles. Uh, Mr. Coles, you have three minutes to present to the committee. Thank you. I'm the chairman of the Cheswick Green Residents Association. My property is directly opposite the school and my children currently attend. There are many things on tonight's agenda, and you will have had many documents to read through regarding these applications. Summarised here are the concerns and objections presented on behalf of the residents of Cheswick Green with regard to the applicant's plans for Cheswick Green School. We acknowledge, there was a, uh, we acknowledge there was an apparent need for additional school places in the parish when this expansion was considered in 2016. That was five years ago. We were challenged that this is still the case today. Birth rates are down across the parish. The cost of living is up and people are having smaller families. The current intake at Cheswick Green Primary School is actually down. There are just 22 children in the reception class. The Cheswick Place development has been fully occupied for over two years and many properties in Blythe Valley are now also occupied. The main developments associated with and justifying the applicant's proposal do not appear to generate the numbers required for a two-form entry. Mitigation. A recent objection sent by email gave the views of the Residents Association with regards to the proposal and the need for mitigation methods. We note that proposed mitigation and required traffic regulation orders are to reduce the impact directly in front of the school, but it makes no acknowledgement of where the displaced traffic will go. What has never been addressed is the impact on the road network should these mitigation methods fail, and we believe they will fail as they're not sustainable longer term. School staff are trained to teach pupils new knowledge, not in managing parents and how they bring their children to school. In all instances, this decision sits with parents or carers and their circumstances, not by the request of the teaching staff. When they fail, the result will be a large volume of traffic access in Cheswick Way. The highway network will not cope with this, no matter the traffic regulation orders put in place in front of the school. The applicant is already aware the A7 and A8 bus service and the company who operates it will not change the timetable to run a service to accommodate the school. Stagger start and finish times. I wonder if the applicant is aware that this has been suggested in the past. During the pandemic, it was suggested to parents to aid social distancing. It was rejected unanimously by parents and mainly those with more than one child at the school. The school never actually implemented it. 
A walking bus, as well as a dedicated bus from Blythe Valley, well, despite the fact the current bus is late most days, how is this going to be paid for? Or if it is paid for, how will it be staffed long term? A group of volunteers? All parents that attended the Cheswick Green Resident Association meetings with children below the age of five had concerns about these methods. Those with infant children uh, rejected it as an option altogether. That's 43% of those that would attend the school. That's potentially 103 additional displaced cars. We're not talking about where they're going to go. Should the applicant's proposal be approved, there is likely to be a large number of conditions attached to it. We wonder whether this committee would normally approve an application that requires so many conditions to be implemented and working before it could be considered a success. The Residents Association does request to be involved in decisions related to those conditions in conjunction with the Planning Committee and the Parish Council. To summarise, mitigation is described as the action of reducing the severity, seriousness and painfulness of something. In this instance, it is suggested to reduce the severe, serious and painful impact on the highways network in front of the school. It doesn't address the impact of displaced cars and parked cars, displaced traffic, sorry, and parked cars on the remainder of the highway network, should you approve this application. I must ask you to sum up. Yeah. Our conclusion, the applicant's proposal should be rejected in its current format. The infrastructure of the village won't cope with the displaced traffic that will create. It will wreak havoc on the road network surrounding the village and beyond. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Coles. Next speaker is uh, Peter Carroll. Thank you, Chair. Again, you have three minutes, Mr. Carroll. Thank you, Chair. Good evening, members. As you've heard from planning officers, this council has a statutory responsibility to provide school places, and the National Planning Policy Framework directs local planning authorities to take a positive, proactive approach to such development. The expansion of this school is necessary to accommodate the developments at Blythe Valley, Cheswick Place, and Mount Dairy Farm and in 2016 was supported by the then leadership of the Parish Council. Three million pounds of Section 106 funding was secured, naming Cheswick Green Primary School. This is the school where parents will have the highest priority for a school place. And the development forms part of the implementation of the decision taken by the Planning Committee in 2016. In May 2021, the clerk on behalf of the Parish Council wrote to me, stating that all new development will face objection and CGPC residents would expect the Parish Council to object on their behalf. So in fact, the Parish Council has changed its position and their objection is not specific to this application, but rather to the notion of development at all, and that is untenable. We've given due regard to the proper objections raised and expended a huge amount of resource on developing mitigations against intensification of road traffic and it's important to note that the suggested severe harm referred to is confined to drop off and pick up times and not throughout the whole of the day. You've heard about the vast range of different uh, mitigation measures that we've developed with the school. And in the experience of our transport consultants, this goes well beyond the usual mitigations provided in other school development contexts. The school has committed in writing to implement these needs and the council's finance director has underpinned the costs. I believe that the steps we've taken are fair, reasonable and proportionate to address the concerns raised. Our children have had a bad time during the pandemic and none more so on the effect of their education. And our young people are unable to advocate for themselves. A community is one that cares for our young people and its old members. And the ability to provide sufficient good quality education places is critical to their health and to have the same opportunities enjoyed by those established residents who are objecting to the application in front of you. Chair, I would respectfully urge your committee to carefully consider the importance of this scheme to delivering our education responsibilities and support this application to provide good quality provision for the future of our young residents in this borough. Thank you, Chair. Thank you, Mr. Carroll. Um, next is Councillor Richard Holt. Councillor Holt, I don't have to tell you, but you've got four minutes. Thank you, Chairman. Um, the Council has a statutory duty to provide sufficient school places for children living in the area. And without the expansion of the primary school places to meet the demand from families moving into Blythe Valley, the Council will not meet its statutory sufficiency duty. That's extremely important when you consider uh, the National Policy Planning Framework, uh, paragraph 95, uh, and the substantial weight that you should give to it. This also uh, 
harks back to the 2016 planning uh, approval uh, when the planning application was granted for 750 uh, residential dwellings uh, and the expansion uh, of uh, Cheswick Green was um, identified as required to meet the growth in pupil numbers. Three million pounds is set aside for that um, and uh, under the section 106 agreement. As you've heard, as cabinet portfolio holder, I made a decision in terms of the statutory process to expand Cheswick Green School and gave consideration to the objections made, and weighed up all of the issues uh, and the, having weighed up all of that information against the Department of Education guidance, I approved the expansion of Cheswick Green subject to planning approval. The Blythe Valley development does not provide sufficient pupil knee, uh, yield to support the creation of a new school and an application by an academy trust to provide primary school, school at Blythe Valley was refused by the Department of Education on the grounds of insufficient demand. You should note that funding to provide uh, a new school would cost eight million pounds and that is not available. It's important to note the refusal that a refusal by the planning committee would not result in a school taking effect at Blythe Valley. Other options were considered about uh, sharing uh, places within different schools, but that's not within the gift of the local authority. School admissions are determined by clear and fair transparent uh, admissions criteria. It was also considered whether or not uh, to relocate Hockley Heath uh, Primary School but that proposal uh, wasn't considered uh, uh, reasonable. Wouldn't, it would create extended travelling times for families currently. No site has been identified. A new school is proposed uh, in the area of part of the draft plan. The use of the school to accommodate children at a primary school has been identified this area linked to strategic within the local plan. However, the new school is to meet the demand for proposed site sites totaling circa 1,600 dwellings. Neither the timing of the delivery nor the location of this proposed school would meet the demands of the Blythe Valley development. There have been substantial mitigations proposed, which you've heard, uh, which uh, go a long way uh, to dealing with the issues of highways. We recognise the highway is a, a clear planning issue that you need to have uh, consideration towards. However, the mitigations proposed um, are comprehensive and should meet the issues in respect of the highway uh, issues for you and in those and in those respects i would ask you please to support the application thank you thank you uh, then councillor hawkins uh, you too have four minutes councillor hawkins thank you uh, thank you chair it's um and thank you. I mean, the, the, the report is so detailed and, and, and even though we disagree, we're not disagreeable. Well, I hope not. It's, uh, and, and I really do hope you, you hear the views, really hear the views of the Palace Council and the Residents Association. Um, the bottom lines here are, are we need school, school for local children who are actually in the parish, who live in the parish. There will be impact on the highway and the council's responsibility for placing uh, schools, uh, children in local schools. The children are going to, uh, the, the ones that we're catching for, do actually live in the parish. Um, and notwithstanding what uh, Peter, Cantle, uh, Peter mentioned, it's, um, look, you know, and the report highlights, and, and I know from my position, I'm speaking as a ward council and not as cabinet member for high, who covers highways, there will be an adverse impact on, on this and you sort of think well what am i doing here of offering support for this if it was a commercial development i don't think we would be even talking now uh, because there will be impact but there has been substantial mitigation and and I'm, I'm i'm grateful that everything i've been asking for for the last couple of years i've been brought to uh, brought to fruit because at one time i, was, I thought there, there might not even be funding for a, a, a school bus and I'd just like to clarify, if, if Kim can clarify that letter from uh, Paul Johnson uh, later on, if you can. He, he's going to cover what I'm, I'm actually just one more push that I want to ask for. Uh, the impact will be, will be there, uh, but it will be incremental, but it will be there. Um, 
I still hope that um, the number of people, pupils actually uh, living in Cheswick Green that go to other schools, there's 120 at the moment that live in Cheswick Green that go to other schools. Now, some of those will be new pupils from, um, from Bly Valley. But even two years ago, before it was really, uh, people were moving in, there was something like 95 pupils. So hopefully, with new spaces, they might take up some of the... Uh, some of the uh, the capacity. Um, I know we haven't talked about it today, but something, if if the impacts are are worse than we, we think, we may have to look at a, a separate access uh, to the rear of the school in due course. How that's going to be funded, I don't know, but that's something we can park for the moment and look at when the when the impacts are, are realised. Um, and my finally, it's, um, and I do, I'm grateful for all the conditions, but I know and we know as councillors that if we want a TRO or a school streets order in our ward, it goes through the annual process. Now, we don't know exactly how things will kind of pan out here. Will we need a more, another TRO extended into Fox and Grove? Do we need a school streets provision there? Uh, into Badger Close as well? And I'm, just, I'm going to finish on this, uh, Chair. Uh, we might not know that for three or four or five years' time. Now, I would like either a reserve set aside, or I think we're getting it now, a commitment that if, if issues like that we find that we do need to take action further down the line, those that area, this issue, will be taken outside as an exception, outside the annual process for TROs and school streets. Uh, colleagues, I do support this, but I think you know, we must realise there will be an impact. So we need to ensure that some of us might be here in three or four years' time when the impacts are realised. We need to make sure that uh, there's somewhere in writing that say any further impact uh, will be dealt with as an exception. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor Hawkins. And finally, Councillor Margaret Gosling. Councillor Gosling, you have four minutes. Thank you. I'm Vice Chair of Cheswick Green Parish Council. Um, basically, this, we feel this application should be refused. It's been made using out-of-date and wildly optimistic information. It's going to cause a huge negative impact on every resident of Cheswick Green Village due to the increase of traffic and parked vehicles at drop-off, especially at drop-off and pick-up times. Firstly, the estimate of the required place is far too high. It's based on 2015 to 16 predictions, which were made before Cheswick Place and Bye Valley West developments started. Cheswick Place is now complete, so the children are in school. Many houses are also occupied on Blythe Valley, and so numbers there are going to be less than predicted. The school is currently not full, particularly in the younger age groups, with 22 in Foundation 2. Extra children are going to come from elsewhere in the borough and possibly outside, almost certainly by car, as there's no suitable public transport. An ageing population within the village also means less primary children. Many of us who moved there in, with young families 40 or so years ago are still there and are now retired. Now, secondly, the assumption that parents will use a school bus is vastly over-optimistic from Blythe Valley. None we've spoken to would consider putting children on a bus. Again, they're going to come by car, no safe cycling or walking route, and it's a too far a distance. The route from Vive Valley, it's either by the dangerous narrow country lanes or the very busy and congested Stratford Road. And I'd like you to just note that there was yet another serious accident at the bottom of Crennell's Lane just yesterday. And this has happened despite the improvements put in place, but possibly not helped by the fact that this junction has been flooded for several weeks. The A7A8 bus doesn't pass the school and timings are not suitable and they're not going to be altered as the bus serves other schools. The stop nearest to Crennell's Lane is sited so that there's need to cross a busy road at a point with poor visibility. All of the above means the estimate of increased traffic given by the applicant is far too low. That given by cheap PGA is much likely to be more realistic. Putting parking restrictions close to the school is just going to move the problem further away, blocking more roads and will come at a cost if it is to be enforced. The situation could be a matter of life and death if emergency service vehicles can't get through. Making it harder to do a U-turn at the end of Foxland just means drivers will do so in Badger Close or Saxonwood Road. 
Staff parking provision is probably going to be inadequate, so staff will still park on nearby roads, creating congestions at present. It's unlikely they're going to walk or cycle due to the distance they'll probably have to travel and the amount they need to carry. The walking bus is certainly the route via Saxonwood Road particularly is a non-starter as the area in the Swales floods every time there's heavy rain and the gradients of that path are dangerous. It's often also very muddy if there's no flood. It appears the cost of staffing and or supervising the bus has not been properly worked out. And also uh, members of the parish council are appalled at the just this huge number of preconditions that have been set if this is going to be passed. These should have been considered and ironed out before the application came to the planning committee, working with residents via the parish council. In conclusion, we are aware all children need a suitable school place and an opportunity for a good education, but this is not the solution that is needed as the demand is simply not there in this part of the borough. The whole project needs much more careful thought as to exactly where the extra places will be required. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you. Um, it is my responsibility to start the debate. The council standing order is required to move the motion. Although I am moving the motion, I am still undecided on how I'll vote. Do I have a second, please? Councillor Davis, thank you. Um, Councillor Hawkins asked a question um, in his uh, presentation. Can I assure Councillor Hawkins that every member of the committee has a copy of uh, uh, Paul Johnson's letter um, in full. Um, okay, members, uh, Councillor Goff. Thank you, uh, Mr. Chairman. Um, I listened uh, very intently to the, uh, well, to, to all the speakers, but uh, I was listening to um, Mr. Coles uh, initially and uh, I very, very much feel for residents when it comes to um, the frustrations around uh, school pick-up and drop-offs because I happen to live right next to a school. And, uh, you know, they, they can be a major problem at certain times of the day, you know, and traffic is a real, real problem. So I do appreciate your frustrations when it comes to traffic. However, um, I think I'd be more upset if I was unable to find a place for my children to go to school. And I think it's very, very important that we do have places for children to go to school. So as much as it is frustrating at certain times of the day, uh, I don't think that outweighs the balance of the requirement for uh, places for children to go to school. So uh, I'll be supporting this chair. Unless I hear Thank anything you, Councillor Pinwell. Thank you, Chair. Um, I think our children have suffered a lot over the last couple of years, and education is absolutely imperative for a good start to life. And I believe that uh, it is very much upon us to put the interests of our children <laughs> right at the front of our minds. I am very mindful that this issue on Cheswick Way um, at school pick-up and school drop-off times has been a running sore in Cheswick Green for many years now. And I must say, I am not at all convinced that the mitigations as they stand will remove the problem with the increased growth. Um, and I'm very much encouraged by what M Councillor Hawkins had to say about the need to keep the situation under constant monitoring and to look at contingency solutions that could be turned to if the mitigations do not work. Um, but at the same time, I think it is absolutely clear that the balance of this debate has to lean towards providing the places that children will need and particularly um, to give a good solution to Blythe Valley Park. Thank you, Councillor Pinnell. I'll, I'll just comment on one of the things you said. Um, of course, Councillor Hawkins currently is in exactly the right position to be able to influ influence that uh, somewhere further down the line. We don't know um, 
that further down the line whether he will still be in that position. Um, but certainly, uh, we, some of us here, will still be, and we can. Uh, we we've got it recorded that that's uh, been been debated here at this this evening's meeting. Councillor Allen. Thank you, Chairman. Oh gosh, we are between a rock and a hard place. Um, obviously, uh, we have a problem because we have a, a statutory right, uh, duty rather, to uh, um, uh, put in, um, provide uh, uh, school places for children, and that is absolutely paramount to us. Um, but I, I've uh, travelled down um, Cheswick Way in those uh, um, very busy times, and it is an absolute nightmare, I know, from my own personal experience. So I know, um, I also understand um, and worry about the uh, impact that the uh, extra traffic is going to have. Um, I have got a couple of questions though I'd like to ask. Um, the uh, parish council members have talked about intake numbers. Can anybody actually um, provide us with the, uh, the actual intake um, numbers or um i don't know what, whether there's anything uh, in there can that can it be um confirmed that there aren't quite so many um uh children um require uh, places required and also um the highways officers can you tell me anything about where the displaced traffic is likely to go can be able to answer that. Uh, Thank you. Um, or, or, or can it be assumed that the two speakers have given us actual information? Um, Chairman, I cannot tell you, members, what the um, current school role is as of today. I, I, I personally don't have that information in front of me. But what the um, committee report does go into is where the expected additional 210 children will, will um, arrive from. And in that guise, um, it, it's likely that 147 pupils out of the 210 um, extension will be from Blythe Valley Park. 49 pupils will be drawn from Cheswick Place or Mount Dairy Farm, as the playing team know it. And then there will be 14 probably from elsewhere. Um, so that is my understanding on, on that aspect of it. I can't, as I said, I, I don't know the existing role. You had a question on highways as well. Uh, um, ben? Uh, yep, yeah, thank you, Chair. Um, ultimately, with the new TRO, uh, it would result in double and single yellow lines being installed, um, which would then ultimately result in vehicles being displaced either further along Cheswick Way. Um, part of the reason and the justification for implementing that, those TROs is to try and encourage uh, existing residents and members of the school that may currently travel by car um, to hopefully then change their travel behaviours, um, because then ultimately if they're then not being able to park outside the front of the school and may end up actually parking nearer to their house than to the school, then they may, or hopefully, will be encouraged to walk or cycle or scoot or any other form of uh, sustainable travel uh, to the school instead. Please, Councillor Allen. Thank you. Thank you for that. Um, when the TRO is uh, finally established, can we be sure that it'll be enforced? Mr. Tavery. Thank you, Chair. Certainly the Council currently has a team of uh, civil enforcement officers that are based uh, in Solo Town Centre and are deployed around all the schools in the borough. We rate the schools on a red, amber, green basis based on the actions that we find at each school and they're deployed on, on that basis. So uh, they certainly will be at that school to monitor and depend on what they see, we'll, we'll adjust their deployment based on the actions taken, Councillor. But we certainly there. There's about eight mobile officers now around the borough looking at schools. Councillor Cole. Thank you, Chair. 
I live by a very large school which has very heavy traffic so I, I do appreciate where you're coming from but what I found is that good schools and I hear that Cheswick Green is a good school attracts pupils from other areas so you're going to get that attraction of drawing uh, children in from other areas but we're looking at numbers what might be going in the next year or two years or three years what we need to do is plan for five, 10, or even 15 years into the future. Because if you're going to add on extensions to schools, it becomes very expensive. And that's what's happened in my ward. So we do need to look at the future. And I think this is the right way to go. And I'll support this. Councillor Butler. Thank you, Chairman. As, as I mentioned at the beginning, um, due to an interest in this, I, I I won't be voting on this. Um, however, I, I will make a, a comment on this. Uh, and I've, I've just, um, I've got the figures, uh, the, the, the current numbers as of February this year, the school capacity is 240. Uh, it has 241 pupils. Uh, and that is uh, figures as of the 11th of Feb this year. Now, as we've said, the, the uh, mitigating factors that we've got here the the school bus the tro's etc are good news but they need to be monitored in actual fact parking issues are rife at just about every school throughout the borough every school has parking issues and most of them don't have the mitigating factors that we've got here they don't have a school bus they don't have the, the TROs that are, that are that are planned. So, as I said, I won't be voting on this. I can't vote on this. However, I I, I am satisfied that the measures that have been put in place and are going to be monitored will benefit the school as we move forward. Thank you, Chair. Thank you. Um, yes, I, I I would agree that every school in the borough has uh, um, uh, a similar uh, issue regarding um, parking and highways. However, it is only for a short period of time on a daily basis. When you were, the, one of the applications we had prior to this one, um, there was highways issues uh, considered um, and we were calculating how long the these highways issued were, were, were lasting and it was suggested that they could have lasted for up to eight hours a day including a Saturday and a Sunday we know full well we've all got schools in our woods I've got three within 100 yards of one another. You can imagine what that's like. Um, but it is only for a short period of time. And this is a rhetorical question. Um, if, if, if the numbers are reducing in the school, doesn't that mean that the number of vehicles are reducing in the school? Uh, as I say, it's a rhetorical question. Someone in the... Councillor Pinwell. Yeah, thank you, Chair. That, that stimulates a thought with me, to be honest, that we take this decision against the background of the Council embarking on its net zero strategy and investing quite significantly into a walking and cycling strategy, all aimed at reducing the use of cars, which are a significant carbon gobbler in a carbon emitter in our society and on that basis i think i would encourage whichever way this decision goes the parish council and the residents association to get behind those strategies and to encourage residents in their area and also those who suffer this problem in other schools across the borough to get behind strategies that are there and available for reducing car use and encourage the use of the walking buses and the school buses that there appears to be a resistance against by, by residents to pick up. 
Good point. Well made. Uh, Councillor Davis. Thank you, Chairman. Uh, like you, Chairman, the, somewhere in, in my ward, we have three schools all together, and it's a nightmare. It has taken one of my colleagues nearly nine years, nine years, to get some positive action on putting down and enforcing additional lineage and other traffic orders. And this may be coming about soon. I'm sure the good people of Cheswick Green don't want to be waiting nine years for an answer. It's got to be right first time. Difficult, but we must do it. In terms of enforcing uh, TROs, when it comes to lines, the police don't want to know. The chief of police here in Solihull doesn't have the manpower to do it. His officers are too busy. They're out doing what we expect them to do in the community. They haven't got time to go around to each school at chucking out time and start um, and start putting stickers on windscreens or filling out forms or whatever they do these days. Whether traffic wardens would be able to enforce it, I don't know. Um, Kim mentioned uh, the traffic orders. Uh, is that for um, a single line? And uh, is it on both? On, you, you showed that curve. You showed the curve and in the road, and you mentioned the traffic order. Is that for single line? And is, it, is it on both sides? Before you answer, Kim, isn't that something that has to go out to consultation first? So we, 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 we don't know is the answer because it has to go out to consultation. Yeah. Because we, we, what we would have, Chairman, is like they do have near some schools, which is uh, no parking between the hours basically of arrival and the hours of leaving, which means that uh, the residents can carry on during the daytime or their visitors, more like, to be able to park outside the house that they're, uh, they're visiting. Clearly, this school is wanted. I, I can hardly think that the powers that be would have applied for this had they not been in need of uh, additional space. We have, as we've heard already, uh, a duty to supply uh, schools and places. And um, this is obviously what they need at this school and uh, we, we we've got to go along with this in my book because uh, somebody's mentioned i mean our children are the most important in all these uh, various matters traffic orders and all the rest of it it's our children our young children who are the most important and it's for us to make sure that the facilities are there so that they get a good education from from day one um i would like though to, if we can, get some sort of condition on things coming back to us or, or whatever in regards to traffic orders so that uh, we can keep an eye on this, um, if not this committee, uh, through Councillor Hawkins uh, and his Cabinet post. Thank you, Chairman. Um, I'm looking for advice from officers. Um, Mr. Tagovy, Paul, please. Thank you, Chair. In regard to the traffic regulation or the process, if planning committee is minded to approve it today, the principle then would be the indicative layout that's shown in Kim's plan today, which basically mirrors what's required from the Highway Code. So the total junction protection around the junctions, uh, that would be a double yellow line system, and then there'll be a single yellow line to protect, uh, prevent parking at the school arrival and departure times, which is a typical treatment that you see at most, at most schools around the borough. The school keep clear, zigzags will be maintained, but modified to allow the new zebra crossing, which is a, a no stopping restriction right outside the school gate. So the, the, the principles is to reduce the, the need for parents to get to the school gate, which is where they all try and get to at most schools, and to move them around a little bit further out from the, from the school entrance, about a five to 10 minute walking distance. But once planning committee give approval to that in, in planning conditions, we have then approval to advertise those restrictions 
and then any representations are received come back to the head of highway management myself to review the report and i have powers to take that decision or referring back to the cabinet member if there's a contentious issue that comes back in that, in that respect i hope that's clear does that answer your question councillor davis yes and i can understand the the logic uh, of where you're coming from on that one but i'm just not sure you know, we, if we approve this tonight, that's that. And if we don't get the traffic orders that we're envisaging, um, then we might consider we made a wrong decision. That's all I'm concerned about. Kim, Kim you, you seem to want to give some input here. Thank you, Chairman. Um, for the clarity of members, um, we have condition four in your pack, so that's on page 204 of your papers. And that is a Grampian condition <clears throat> that requires that um, no development shall begin <coughs> excuse me, until the highway traffic regulation order. And then we detail plan numbers, so there are three plans, um, have, been, have been completed and authorised by the local highway authority. So that's on condition four. So we, have, we already have a scheme which again, I ran through. <clears throat> um, it may be that after consultation, that scheme, as with planning applications, are tweaked to you know, take account of, of what consultation responses come back. But there is certainly a scheme which, um, would, which is in, you know, um, drawn up and would go out to consultation. And there is, there is yellow lines on both sides of the road to Cheswick Way. That condition, I think, would cover my concerns, Chairman. I think it does, actually, uh, Councillor. Uh, Councillor Allen. Well, thank you, Chairman. I think that probably covers everybody's concerns about it. Um, I, just want, I just want to make one sort of thing uh, about the enforcement. As I understand it, and I'm sure Mr Toby can correct me if I'm wrong, that um, if there's a TRO anywhere, it is actually the council enforcement team that look after the enforcement. Uh, the police actually look after obstruction and that sort of thing. So it is actually a council responsibility to, uh, to check on the enforcement. Thank you. Chair, that's, that is correct. You got in before me, Councillor Allen. <laughs> Um, okay, I can't. Uh, oh, yes, uh, yeah, you're a slow hand, Luke. Yes, uh, Councillor Clemens. Thank you, Chair. Um, so, Solihull Borough is seen as an aspirational place to live for, for a lot of people. And uh, when we're talking about future planning for the borough, um, not many schools or not so many schools can actually look to um, increase their size. So, for something such as this one that is able to do so, I think it does help Solihull children go to a Solihull school. And um, parking around schools was actually what led me to want to become a councillor in the first place due to my own 10 years of stress, morning and evening. And um, so I understand that it causes stress to residents as well as parents. And most parents would love their children to walk to school if possible. But when we have to go to work, unfortunately, the times don't match and it's not something feasible for most people. And when I did go to look at Cheswick Green Primary, I think it's quite unique in the amount of roads um, around the school where there are actually places to look to park and most schools don't actually have that feasibility. And so, although it's good for a TRO possibly, and um, the addition of the zebra crossing would certainly be welcome. Um, all I can say is that I will be approving this application this evening. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, I can't see any other indications of members wishing to uh, ask questions or make comments. So therefore, I will be moving straight to the vote. Um, the recommendation is one of approval subject to conditions. Those in favour, please show. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven. That's unanimous, Chairman. Can we put you down as an abstention, Councillor Butler? Thank you. The matter is approved. Uh, and uh, you're free to leave if you wish. There are a couple of very short items that uh, I now have to do.
Item 28 on our agenda is uh, the appeals report. Um, and it all looks very good. We only lost them one. Um, so keep doing what we're doing is what I would say. Everybody happy with it? Thank you. And finally, um, item 29, delegated decisions. Can I take them as being uh, read uh, unless I see any hands? Lovely, thank you. Um, that brings this meeting of the Planning Committee to a close. And uh, can I say thank you, members, thank you, officers. I think uh, the idea of starting at five o'clock with a break was useful. Um, and we finished well in advance of what I actually expected. So um, thank you again. Good night, safe journey home.